Thank you, everyone. So are we ready to start, Dave? Um, can be, yes, I, I can see it's just come around to two o'clock. So uh, welcome to the afternoon uh, session of Planning Committee on the 20th of August. I start the meeting by just doing a roll call again of members, just to make sure everybody's here for the afternoon session. We've had apologies from Councillor Clear, so we'll start with Councillor Evans. Present. Thank you. Councillor Gordon-Smith. Present. Thank you. Councillor Laming. Present. Councillor McLean. Present. Councillor Reid. Present. Councillor Raphael. Present. Councillor Rutter. Present. And Councillor Bento is as Deputy Member. Present. Thank you. They confirmed that all members are present and I will give an outline of the uh, officers that are with us this afternoon. Uh, for the first item, which is item 11, we have Liz Marston, uh, Liz Marston as a case officer. And then for items 12 and 13, we have Rose Lister. And also for item 13, we have Sarah Hayes from Environmental Health to join us for that item. And uh, as mentioned, the public speakers for the first item this afternoon are Dee Hewitt, who is speaking on behalf of James Goodwin and Mrs Stella Epperton, who had also registered, uh, Councillor Judith Clemenson as ward member, and Caroline Cahill as applicant. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, so good afternoon from me. Um, we are now moving to agenda item 11. 20 slash 00761 slash FUL, residential development to include one two storey three bedroom detached house and two two storey two bedroom semi detached houses with associated on site parking and turning area utilising existing highway access off Bunkers Hill. Uh, case officer is Liz Mars Marsden. Good afternoon, Liz. And I can see you've got your presentation ready to give to us. So over to you, Liz. Good afternoon. Um, could I just start, though, with um, a verbal update of some comments that came in? Uh, these were a supporting letter and photographs which were sent to members of the planning committee by the applicants and were seeking to justify the proposal by reference to the growing population of Denmead. Um, and failure to deliver the <coughs> houses allocated. Policy, it's claimed that the application accords with the MPPF in the delivery of homes on a small site and making optimum use of the site. Um, compliance with pattern of development in the surrounding area in terms of density, gaps between properties and garden sizes, and reference to other development that has been permitted on sites in the district. Social, there is also um, the fact that social media discussion suggests a measure of support for the proposal. So that was the from, from the applicants. Um, they also submitted some photographs, which I hope we've got and we'll be able to see later. So the proposal is for three dwellings um, on, from, on Bunkers Hill and you will see the site there outlined in red. Um, that's just the photograph. The, um, the actual settlement boundary of Denmead runs along here. Well, there you go, I've even put it in there. Um, and uh, so it is clearly outside the settlement boundary of Denmead. Site again outlined in red. This is an aerial photo showing the site and which is a present laid predominantly to grass with mature trees along the frontage and along the rear boundary with hedges to either side. Um, is there any way of getting, reducing this, David? No, I think it is. As okay. It is. Um, the originally submitted, the we did get amended plans, which on the originally submitted layout showed um, the frontage of the property entirely given over to, to parking spaces with um, large turning areas. This wasn't considered to be acceptable from a tree point of view. You'd have cars parked under trees and 
pressure to remove the trees due to uh, debris falling onto the cars and it was also felt to be very um, uncharacteristic of the area. Amended plans were subsequently submitted which reduced the number of spaces, took them further away from the trees so they cleared the crown spreads and um, was you know improved from that point of view. The highways are happy with the access to the proposal. Uh, the ground floor plans, it's um, I think it's two two bedrooms and three one three bedroom. Yep, that's that's right. First floor plans. So you've got a single detached house and a pair of semi detached properties. The south and west rear elevations, as you can see, they are slightly more contemporary in design um, due to the use of materials and, and the type of fenestration that is to be proposed. Side elevations showing what they look like from the side with a, with a section. Um, again, with the amended plans, they did slightly reduce the height of the proposal, particularly um, the single detached dwelling to form more of a transition between the Springside to the north and Woodlands to the south um, to, and sort of to go with the slope of the land, which is on a on a rise. Photographs of the site that's looking from the front along the frontage towards Springside here. And you will see there is a porch and windows in the side elevation of that property, which is separated from the site and by, uh, by a hedge. Uh, the other side towards between woodlands is a taller hedge, again quite quite dense, but that runs along the full length of the plot. There you go, that's a bit more of a cobbled together photo showing Springside and then the full extent of the plot to the existing woodland at the rear. And also the hedge along the other side, so that shows the plot in its entirety. This is the view from the access looking southwards up Bunkers Hill, the Creech Woods are up here and looking to the northeast towards Denmead. Sorry, moved on a bit quickly on that one. And this is taken from the other side of the road, just looking towards the, towards the site. This is Springside, and mm -hmm. these are the mature trees that exist along the frontage of the property. The recommendation is to refuse as the proposed development is contrary to policy MTRA 4 of the local plan part 1 in that it provides new residential dwellings for which there is no justification. The density and scale of the development would be out of keeping with and detrimental to the character and appearance of the area. Thank you. Thank you Liz, thank you. I'm just waiting to come back on. Um, I think I'm there in the corner. Right, public speaking. We um, have three objectors registered, but one person out of the three is going to speak. Is that correct? Dave, can we take that off the screen now, the refusal recommendation? And I believe that the person that's going to speak for the three minutes is D. Hewitt. Is that correct? I wonder, Dave, if we can just put the screen back on. Lovely. Yes, thanks. Um, so, um, Miss Hewitt, Mrs. Hewitt, you're going to speak. Is that correct? It is. Good afternoon. So, Welcome. Thank you. Okay. And then if um, Mr. Goodwin or Mrs. Etherton want to join in after the three minutes if there are any questions. 
from councillors that they wish to answer, then they are welcome to do that as they have registered to speak. OK, neither of them are here, but um, obviously. All I right, okay, just you. OK, that's fine. So when you're ready, you have three minutes. OK, thank you. I represent the, the many objectors to this planning application. A total of 33 objections were made from 28 households. Bunkers Hill is a hamlet with 13 houses, including a garden nursery, not open to the public, plus a gospel hall. Its character is defined by its close proximity to creased woods. Bunkers Hill is outside of the settlement boundary of Denmead. It is semi-rural, not built up, and is adjacent to ancient woodlands. We support all the reasons Denmead Parish Council gave for refusal for this planning application, as this echoed the contents of the majority of the objections. It conflicts with the Denmead Neighbourhood Plan made in 2015 and the Winchester, Winchester District Local Plan. It is contrary to policies including MTRA 4. When retrospective planning permission was given for the illegally installed entrance, it was stated in writing to Springside that this permission in no way changed the status of the land, that it was still deemed agricultural. Therefore, this application will be development in the countryside on agricultural land. There have been no new builds, only replacements of existing dwellings in Bunkers Hill. When this land was last sold at auction in 2016, the advice given by Winchester Council to prospective buyers was that this site was unlikely to receive planning permission in the foreseeable future. The proposed plans to maximise the plot and build three houses is totally out of context with the other dwellings. It is more in common with an urban area rather than reflect the semi-rural characteristics of the area. As a result, this would have a detrimental impact on the character of the area and nearby Creasy's Wood. The plot has been the subject of a number of refusals, including appeals for single dwellings and two individual dwellings. There are, there are a further six green spaces on Bunkers Hill, two of which have already been cleared in readiness. If approval were to be granted, a precedent would be set and these plots would also be infilled. This would have a detrimental effect on the area. Although mention has been made of amending plans to accommodate a meadow, trees at the front and wildlife, close mesh wire fences have already been erected on both the eastern and western boundaries, which include the ancient woodland at the rear. By doing this, it has excluded all living wildlife entering the site. The ecological survey found slow worms and grass snakes on the site. Despite this, the site has been strimmed twice in the last week to ground level, hardly a wildlife friendly gesture. The original owners kept it as a bird and wildlife sanctuary for over 40 years. This has always been an area of bio diversity. Bunkers Hill provides a green causeway for people and animals to, cre to access creased woods. We have a large number of protected trees and agricultural land to our east and west boundaries. We were heartened by the number of objections from both residents and visitors made to Winchester and on the Denmi community Facebook, reflecting just how much this area means to both residents and visitors and the positive impact on both well-being and um, mental chair, health it has. Time is up, chair. That's it. I'm, I'm finished. Just finish your sentence if you wish. You have finished. I have finished. Thank you. Thank you. I was just looking, and I'm sorry, I got distracted. Um, to see whether they actually, they actually some of the woods are in the application site. Can you help me there? Are they? Sorry, uh, is is that question to myself or is to that? You, yes, yes. Okay, I, yeah, okay. I know that certainly the the woodland backs on, and it's the gentleman that owns the house at Hillbrow that owns those woodlands at the back. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, next public speaker, we have no one from the Parish Council. Thank you very much, um, you. Um, Mrs. Hewitt. And if you'd like to put your video and your microphone off, obviously Sorry. you will remain in the in the meeting. There are um, no other questions, Chair, for that. Oh, so sorry. Don't worry, there are no other questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vice Chair. So, sorry for that mental lapse. Um, right, the next um, public speaker is the Ward Councillor, Councillor Clementson. Good afternoon, Councillor Clementson. Hello, good afternoon to you Hello. all. And thank you for you the have five minutes already. 
Okay, well, I shan't be in five minutes. Um, thank you to everyone for the opportunity to speak. And I have some concerns, so I am not going to repeat anything that has already been made in the objections. I'll take that as read and that I concur with those views. So I won't repeat them. My concern is that I have been involved with other members um, who have properties along that road and who are experiencing some quite serious problems with the speed and the traffic that is all coming already coming down there and coming down from Southwark into Denmead and the difficulty that they are having um, egressing their own properties that's the nursery and above a, a gentleman who owns um, some land next to the nursery I think comes from Springwood um, is finding it very very difficult because of the sight line um, to add more vehicles egressing onto that Bunkers Hill I think would be a very very difficult and make a difficult situation worse it's also quite busy because of the popularity of Creech Woods but the entrance to that is at the top of the hill so it has a much clearer view in both directions now i was pleased to see the the photographs that were shown there because the very point at which uh, the resident whom i've been speaking is concerned is actually opposite that plot of land um so that's my first point i think it's it we do not need any more vehicles accessing that road the second thing is that the in my view the application that has been put in is totally unacceptable for the area. It's not sympathetic, as has been pointed out, to, to the character of Bunkers Hill. And it also, uh, as has been pointed out, it will set a precedent for other people who have some undeveloped land in that area to put forward to build similar or make a similar development. My feeling is that this has been um, put in to maximise the, the potential return and not necessarily to, um, shall I say, the personal return rather than providing more housing for people in Denmead. There is already a major development close to and Denmead has already got new homes going there. I accept that there has been a lot of infill recently in gardens, etc, etc. <laughs> but I do not believe that they have had or would have the same impact on the environment as would be the case on Bunkers Hill. Perhaps and I've seen so many uh, applications and refusals on this one piece of land, perhaps there will come a time when it would be approved to put one small cottage that was built characteristically and in keeping with Bunkers Hill. But I would strongly object to, to uh, a three house modern development in this area and I hope that the uh, councillors on the planning committee who are not necessarily au fait with the area would um, perhaps accept the, the uh, views of those that do live and use Bunkers Hill and that's all I have to say so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Okay. It could be that there are questions for you from the committee. Um, Vice Chair, any questions? None indicated so far, Chair. Thank you. So thank you very much, Councillor Clementson. If you could just turn your video and your mic uh, off. Chair, sorry, Councillor Bento has just crept in with a question. Oh, Councillor Bento. Yep. Councillor Bento. Coming, yeah, just coming from the chat. Thank you. Um, question, please. Um, uh, can you inform us um, which areas of land could possibly 
um, have applications made on them. Look at the di I'm looking at the diagram on page 85 or the map on page 85 of the agenda, which shows all the cottages and so on. Mm -hmm. um, there are one or two plots of land. There are any of those ones which you consider may want to put proposals in? Well, I don't know that they will. I'm saying that they would be suitable for development, one of which is, in fact, the piece of land that I referred to, which is owned by another member um, a, who lives on that, that um, Bunkers Hill. Um, but it is an undeveloped piece of land which is virtually opposite this this site and it was the uh, access and egress into that particular piece of land that the resident was concerned about because it, it is a dangerous trying to get out of there it, the sight line is blocked so I've been speaking to highways about it but what I'm saying is that there is land there and if uh, an approval was given to build outside of the boundary I believe it would open a floodgate for other people seeing their own land as suitable for development. Councillor Bento, could I just politely remind you that we're looking at this parcel of land, there's no highway subjection and um, precedent is not one of the reasons for refusal. Uh, um, any further questions, Councillor Bento? No. Um, okay. Vice Chair, any, any further questions for Councillor Clemenson? Um, yes, we have Councillor McLean now, Chair. Thank you. Councillor McLean. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to put that on at the moment. Um, Councillor Clemenson, just looking at the, going right to the front page of this, page 85, we show effectively buildings and cottages either side, one of them of, of some fair size. Mm -hmm. How do we, um, looking at it, and you say to yourself, OK, there's a gap in the middle, which we accept, somebody's putting an application in to build three properties on what would fill the gap. Can I just have your comments on that? You didn't really in your presentation talk about that at all, just so I can get an understanding of where you're coming from representing the local. Uh, I think I think in answer to that, Councillor McLean, is that they are properties that have been built and in my view are too large for the area and detract, if you like, from the initial few properties as you enter Bunkers, Bunkers Hill, but they are there. It's there and um, perhaps with hindsight, it shouldn't have been allowed to be that large, but it is and it is well blended in that area. Now, this is why I made the comment to you that I would feel that perhaps rather than continually have applications that are refused, an application may be approved that is actually in keeping. And this development as proposed is, in my view, not in keeping with the other cottage like homes that are along Bunker Hill, with the exception of the very large property that edges um, Creech Wood. Could I just remind you, Councillor McLean, as I reminded Councillor Bentoad, that we're considering this plot and not the other properties around. We're not suggesting any other alternative because this is what we've got in front of us. Um, with respect, all... Chair, with respect, Chair, that's why I asked the question in the way that I did. OK. Right, well, you've had your answer from Councillor Clements. And, um, and, and any further questions, Vice Chair? No further questions, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Clements. Um, so um, if I may just interrupt and, and just add to that, um, um, Chair, if you'll forgive me. Uh, what I did say is there is a, a very uh, recently um, refurbished cottage that was a, a used and there were some decisions about that. But what I was saying, it was built sympathetically and in keeping with the area. And therefore, I wouldn't object if it was a, a something like that. Yeah, we're not I made that really clear. design applications, Councillor Clements. Thank you. Thank you for your Thank contributions. You. And if you'd like to turn your mic and video off, that'd be great. Thank you. And so the final public speaker is Councillor, oh no, not Councillor, Caroline. Cahill, apologies if that's not how you say your surname. 
that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you have three minutes when you're ready. Good afternoon. Since our last planning application four years ago, we have identified five factors which we feel have had an impact on this site, none of which appear to have been addressed in the planning officer's report. One, the revised NPPF has requirements that councils must now provide 10% of their housing on small sites under one hectare and should ensure they make maximum. Any development makes optimal use of each site. In 2019, WCC requested we put the site forward as part of their call for small sites. It was accepted and is the only small strategic site in Denmark deemed by strategic planning as capable of delivering four dwellings. Three, two sites in the Winchester district that have very similar characteristics to the application site have been approved under MTRA4. In both applications, the officer stated that although the sites are outside a development boundary, they will not result in any planning harm. The first at Clewis Hill Waltham Chase was approved on appeal in April 2019, and the second at Southwark Road Wickham was approved by delegated decision in March this year. Four, the Denby neighbourhood plan allocated 100 homes to be delivered in the period 2014 to 19. While planning exists for these homes, WCC's own monitoring report showed Denmead has only completed 10 homes from this allocation to date. Five, the SHMA report published in February 2020 confirmed Denmead has an increasing population and will require a further 49 more homes per annum backdated from 2016. These last two points alone indicate there is a pressing need to utilise small areas of suitable land such as the application site. Bunkers Hill is a highly sustainable and integral part of Denmead which lies within the Denmead settlement area. The site has a 23 metre frontage within a ribbon of 13 dwellings on the east side of the road. The planning report comments on the proposal being out of character and appearance of the area However, the proposal leaves visual gaps of 7 metres and 14 metres between the proposed and neighbouring dwellings, greater than many gaps between existing dwellings on Bunkers Hill. The planning officer noted there would not be undue impact through loss of outlook. WCC has approved removal of these gaps by allowing side extensions or replacement properties, removing views of countryside beyond, notably Rose Cottage. The proposed dwellings are screened from the road by mature trees, will have long gardens providing substantial plots and are therefore in keeping with the appearance of other dwellings on Bunkers Hill. The density of the application is less than defined by strategic planning, allowing the application to fit within a semi-rural landscape. It is hoped you will consider all these factors in assessing this application and come to a pragmatic conclusion. Thank okay, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Um, don't go because there might be questions for you. Um, could I just start that off? Um, I, I note from the report that you didn't take pre-application advice before submitting this application. No, we didn't. Well, we did actually contact um, pre-application advice um, and they said that it would just be to, um, down to policy and that there was no point taking it any further. OK, thank you. Vice Chair, any questions for Ms. Mrs. Carr here? Uh, none indicated, Chair. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, oh, uh, Councillor <laughs> Reid. Yes. Councillor Reid, sorry. sorry. It's low. This it was question. due to the fact that it wouldn't work. Um, what was I actually going to say? I've forgotten now. No, it's gone. It's gone. Apologies. Sorry, Councillor Reid, do, do, do you have a question for um, Mr. Well, I had, Chairman, but uh, I'd just actually forgotten what it was. Uh -huh. um, okay. So I'm not, I'm no doubt we'll cover it when we come to the offices. OK, right. So, Vice Chair, that's it, is it? No more questions? Um, yes, that's it, Chair. Perhaps we could indicate to Councillor Clementson that she, she cannot now yeah, I, contribute. I see you've got a yellow hand up, Councillor Clementson. Could you um, take that down? Sorry, I forgot to take it down. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, uh, Mrs. Cahill. Um, but if you could just take off your video and your um, mic, and then obviously you'll be remaining in the meeting.
Yeah. Am I able to just make a comment about the recent what the clearance. clearance of the land? It's not actually clearance. Mm -hmm. your no, because you're only answering questions. Okay. There isn't a question on okay. that. Okay. Not a problem. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, so, um, Liz, anything else you want to say in the light of what you've heard from the public speaking? Um, there's a number of points I could address with regards to the comments made by um, Mrs. Cahill, mm -hmm. um, which I don't know if people yes. are going to ask questions about that or whether I should just address no, them immediately. Just, no. yeah, okay, um, she does refer to two other sites which she says um, were contra uh, MTRA3 but were allowed. Uh, the one in Clewers Hill was allowed it appeal, the council maintain their objection and believe that it is still contrary to policy. The inspector in that case decided that there was insufficient harm to, to warrant a refusal. The other site that was referred to was in North Bohan and um, was in fact an MTRA3 um, development rather than four because it doesn't have a settlement boundary and therefore that was in accordance with our policies. Um, the the fact that the site has been included in the Sheila, as it says very clearly in those papers, this does not allocate sites for development or imply that the council would necessarily grant planning permission just because they're included within the paper. Uh, I think that's it for now, but happy to answer any other questions, obviously. Um, yes, well, Liz, I think um, Mrs. Carhill also mentioned the recommendation that 10% of the housing needed had to be on small sites, but you can answer that later if you if you wish. Well, that 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 is the MPPF, but also the MPPF does not override adopted policies or you know it is a plan led. It suggests that decisions should be made in a plan led way, and we have a five year supply, so it 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 wouldn't, in my view, override the policies. Thank you. Um, Vice Chair, any further questions? No further oh, questions. No, no, we're not at that point. I'm sorry, I don't know what's the matter with me here. Um, right, so we'll move to the questions from councillors. Um, Principle of development and design and layout. Both of those are on page 89. No any questions, Chair. No. So let's move on. Let's move on to impact on the character of the area, impact on neighbourhood amenity. Nothing indicated, Chair. Thank you. Then all the rest of the report, which is landscape and trees, highways and parking, ecology, nitrates and anything else that you want to ask questions on. I think there are no further. Oh, we have Councillor Bentot. Councillor Bentot. Yeah, thank you. I, I was asking about the um, in, the sort of impact on the na neighbourhood. Um, several people have said that it is quite different in nature to the other buildings in that road. Uh, I wonder if you could actually describe the nature of buildings in that road because there seem to be a great variety of buildings. Some are small, there are some terrace, there's some large houses. It hasn't got a, a nature, it's got a completely mixed nature. So I find it difficult that you say that, uh, or anybody would say that houses would upset the nature of the uh, of the road. <coughs> um. Yes, I make that comment in my in my report that it is a huge variety in that area. On the whole, um, you know, it ranges from a very small terrace of narrow properties to much larger dwellings at this end. And, you know, without being too prescriptive about it, it starts out small and it, they gradually get larger as you go further away from Denmead. This would introduce three dwellings very close together in a, you know, where it has become much more spacious. In terms of the, the, the existing dwellings also very widely in their design, but on the whole, 
again, they are more slightly more rural or low key in appearance. And this is, you know, these are fairly modern looking or contemporary looking properties set close together. And I don't feel that they do, you know, contribute to the rural character of the area. OK, thank you. Thank you. So there being no more questions for... Um, Chair, we have Councillor McLean with a question. No, Councillor McLean. Good afternoon. What a lovely sunny day it is out there. Um, so our policies um, support the building of, uh, in inverted commas, affordable properties. And looking at the properties that are being suggested for this site, they would appear to me to be what you would put in inverted commas as affordable properties. They are also um, uh, two, uh, two of them are two bed properties as well, which conform to, um, I think, our policies. So can you just um, put me right as to where um, I'm sort of slightly misreading them because they seem to be plenty of parking. I think they're going to be affordable in terms of, of properties in that area. I don't know, but um, they're, they're, they're of that right size. Can you help me, please? Um, whether they're for, they, these are, as far as I'm aware, open market housing, they're not designed to be affordable in the terms of um, provided by housing providers, which sometimes in rural locations in the countryside that might be acceptable where there is demonstrated to be a need for affordable dwellings, um, as in housing providers. This, you know, open market housing, because they're smaller or whatever, does not necessarily mean that they are affordable and would not comply with policies for the provision of dwellings in the countryside. Um, as as set out. Would I have been Sorry, better something less expensive? They're less expensive, but that's not the same as being affordable. Is that Judy? Yeah, Chairman, I think there's two points here, isn't there? One, it's outside a defined settlement boundary where there's a presumption against all new development unless, uh, and, and policy MTRE4 does allow for some scenarios where we might make an exception to that policy where it was for a, to meet a genuine uh, need to deliver affordable housing for those in need that are on the council's housing register. Uh, and that isn't the case here. This is a market led scheme. It may well be that they are relatively more affordable uh, to purchase, but they are indeed market housing that's contrary to the, the adopted local plan. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McLean. Um, Vice Chair, any more questions from councillors? Uh, no more questions, Chair. Thank you. So we'll move into debate. I'd like to start the debate. Um, I did visit the site. I've never been up Bunkers Hill, surprisingly, um, and I quite agree with the reasons for refusal. Refusal three, it would result in a ribbon development outside the village boundary. Then lead is a large village, market town, whatever you want to call it, um, and was allocated 250 houses in the last local plan, part one. And some of those have been built, some haven't. But they had their own neighbourhood plan. They were the only um, settlement in the area that did their own neighbourhood plan, which had a lot of community work put into it. And it was up to that neighbourhood plan team to say where they wanted the houses and Bunkers Hill wasn't part of it and Bunkers Hill is not part of the settlement boundary. We are in the um, throes of preparing the next local plan once we can get our head around the new government rules but it could be that Bunkers Hill will then come into play as an area but for the current time, it is outside the village boundary, the settlement boundary, and it's against um, the Denmead neighbourhood plan. And until that area is reclassified, I really don't think that we should be accepting more houses and um, asking Denmead to take houses which they clearly don't want in that area. The 250 houses is a lot of houses and they will be um, allocated within the village boundary. 
We have all the other reasons, like it's in proximity to the ancient woodland. I'm sorry to hear that's all been fenced off for wildlife reasons, but not part of this um, application. Um, but I, I can't possibly support an application like this, which is so against policy. Um, so I should be voting to refuse this application. I see, um, Councillor Reid, you've got your hand up. Thank you, Chairman. Um, interesting. Um, the local plan was prepared and areas of land were identified by the community. And as you quite rightly say, it was a neighbourhood led plan. Um, none of the properties, the five plots in Bunkers Hill, were identified as a possible means of expansion. Um, so we look at need. Need, um, Denmead has already got planned its allocation of 250, of which are in the process of being built out. Um, the, the number given by Mrs. Carhill was a little bit vague um, in a sense because there are a lot more houses than she's obviously recognised. What we mustn't forget also is Denmead also has a 3,500 development in conjunction with Southwark and Wickham on the west, on the eastern boundary of its patch. So the reason for need, I think, is much, much reduced. Over the last 18 months or so, there are two sites which have been cleared out of the five. One of them is this site. Um, it's access onto the main road, the Southwark Road is an old fashioned farm gate access. Um, and as stated by Councillor Clemenson, the traffic coming down towards the Bunkers Hill roundabout does move at a fair speed on many occasions. We mustn't forget also that there is on street parking that takes place on the Southwark Hill Road at that point. And as pointed out by, or as noted by Councillor Benton, there is a, a large mix of housing in that particular stretch of road. The neighbourhood plan um, is being reviewed along obviously with the Winchester City Plan. So in 2015, it was not included any of the parcels. Um, so it didn't get added into the 2016 publication of the Winchester Local Plan. I think, Chairman, you have covered it quite well. Um, there have been a number of extensions and rebuilds there. Hillbrow was quite a smallish property. It was large, but it was quite small, but it was reconfigured and it has an awful lot of land that goes with it. The house next door was extended. Um, there are replacement houses, Rose Cottage. Um, the little cottage, which I can load if I can remember its name, um, was extended because it was an extremely small cottage. Um, the opposite side of the road, Thorn Banks, the, the little development there uh, has changed into a religious sect. And the only one that now another clear site, but I understand it has planning permission, is Ash Tree, um, and that is going to be replaced. Um, with another new. So all of the areas that have applied for planning permission and have received planning permission have done so in accordance with the local authority. And it's only the five plots which are outside. It is countryside. It was specified as countryside. I would suggest to the um, applicant that they need to talk to the parish council because the parish council will put together the neighbourhood plan, which will be incorporated into the new Winchester local plan. But as the chairman said, um, that will be after people have actually worked out what the white papers are actually telling us we can and cannot do. I will be voting um, in favour of the officer's recommendation because this land is within countryside. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Vice Chairman, anyone else wanting to speak in debate? No other debate indicated. Oh, 
Oh, <laughs> I should I should wait, shouldn't I? Councillor Bento would like to contribute. Thank Councillor you, Chair. Right, I'd just um, say that I do know the area quite well. I do travel along the Forest Road. It seems a little bit odd that uh, this particular part of Denby isn't within there. Um, those plans there. I don't think the, the three houses on that plot would go amiss. Um, I think it'd be quite a nice plot, plot to have with those those houses there. So I'm quite happy with the houses there, but I shall be voting with the officer as it is completely outside the plans and that's where we are at the moment. I think it's just a shame that uh, that those plans don't permit some, the occasional um, Moving away from them, I've, got to, I've, got to, I've lost the word I want to say, but uh, I, th I think it's a shame that we can't sometimes make exceptions. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Any Anybody else, Vice Chair? Um, I think that's it for debate, Chair. Thank you. Um, so this um, application <coughs> has been um, recommended for refusal. And the reasons, there are three of them, are set out on page 92 with two informatives. So I'll pass over to Dave, who will do the roll call through the list of members. And if you say four, then you're voting to refuse. Dave, over to you. Yes, that's correct, Chair. Thank you for the clarification. Uh, Councillor Evans? Four. Councillor Gordon Smith? Four. Thank you. Councillor Laming. Four. Councillor McLean. Four. Councillor Reid. Four. Councillor Raphael. Four. Councillor Rutter. Four. And Councillor Bentote. Sorry, didn't run my mic on four. So that's all members, Chair. So that application is refused. Um, thank you very much. We'll just um, move on then to the um, next application, which is item 12. We have to change case officers. So thank you very much, Liz. Thank you. Can you get ready? Yes. Yeah. And if I could just point out under agenda item 12, the tree house shouldn't be there. It is just an application for two shepherd huts. Rose will tell us it comes. Yeah, could you just bear with me? I think Mr. Paxman is ready to speak on this. I don't think he's in the lobby at the moment. Uh, well, Mr. Paxman, yeah. I'm just going to give him a call and ask him to come and join okay. us. Afternoon. <laughs> Afternoon, Rose. We're just waiting for the public speaker. Rose, I'm glad you mentioned that tree house because I was wondering where it was as well. <laughs> yeah, I was just saying, Rose, that the tree house it was on there and then it got removed. So it's just an application for two shepherd huts, isn't it? Can't hear you, Rose, sorry. Are you muted? They're probably muted, Chair, whilst uh, Dave makes the phone call. Yeah. OK, well, we haven't started yet, so. Oh, I was going to say, I think the actual 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 was going to say, I think what was she for then, Mrs. Hewitt? Well, she was the speaker in the last application, but she's still on our screen. Okay, we could probably um, hang on. I'll see if I can. Sorry, Chair, I've um, muted Mrs. Hewitt now. Um, I am just, and Mr. Paxman has joined the meeting. I'm just going to let him into the meeting now. Okay, thank you. Could Mrs. Thank Hewitt you. still hear us? 
is Mrs. Stewart leaving the meeting or is she staying in the meeting, is she? Oh, there's Mr. Paxman. Good morning, good afternoon, Mr. Paxman. Hi there, how's it going? Good to see you. Yeah, you too, um, thank you. Right, so we are moving on to agenda item 12. Um, 20 slash 00883 slash FUL, which is the erection of small scale holiday let accommodation consisting of two shepherd huts. And we've just discussed that the tree house is not there. And the case officer is Rose Lister, and Rose is putting her presentation up. So when you're ready, Rose, over to you. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, just a verbal update. The description was changed and has been reflected online and on the um, presentation, but it's still on the report. So it is just for two shepherd's huts. The treehouse has been removed from the application. Uh, so here we have the red line plan and the um, access track here off Prickett's Hill. Here we have an aerial view of the site with Prickett's Hill here. And this is the access track that is also a public right of way. The applicant has demonstrated that he has a vehicle access right of way over that um, footpath. Um, I believe it's currently just for the small holding and but anything above that would have to be um, discussed with the landowner and is considered to be a civil matter. Uh, you can see the two um, local sinks in the area here in Shedfield Common and here is Long Cops. Uh, here we have the block plan of the site. The two blue squares here are where the proposed shepherd's huts would be located on the site and the existing structures as well. Uh, here we have the proposed elevations and floor plans for the shepherd's huts. Uh, they will be slightly raised off the ground, but no more than three metres high. And they would comprise a single bed, um, a bathroom, a small kitchen area and sitting area. So it's a modest level of accommodation. Uh, here we have an illustrative example of what the huts would look like once constructed. And here we have some photos of the site. At the top left hand is a view east from the existing parking area on the site. This is Long Cops at the distance here. On the top right hand side is the view looking north towards the neighbours um, boundary. And the two shepherd's huts would be located approximately here and here. Um, on the bottom level on the left is looking down the access track from the site towards Prickett Hill and on the right hand side is a photo looking west towards the access with Shedfield Common seen here. The recommendation is to permit Thank you. Could we just go back one slide to the one of the access track? Is it still possible to do that? Well, even if it's not, what what were those animals walking up the track? Uh, there are some chickens that are on the small holding, councillor. Right. OK, thank you. So um, we have one public speaker, um, Michael Paxman. I'm not sure if you're the agent or um, the applicant, but you're a supporter of the application. Yeah, that's right. No, I um, I submitted, I just helped Phil with the application. He okay. just asked me to submit it on his behalf. Um, I know Rose has pretty much covered most things. Um, the only thing really was just, just to say that, um, yeah, from, from the application, some of the points that were raised, obviously we just wanted to try and um, mitigate any concerns that there may have been 
Um, I think one of the main things is obviously we look to remove the tree house just because in terms of getting a tree report and, you know, the concern in that sort of um, type of building that was going to go there, um, we thought, well, if we reduce it and it's quite a low scale type thing with the shepherd's huts, um, that was more along the lines that was consistent, which everybody would be happy with. Um, I think the thing is what um, Mr Cochrane wanted to get across really was that he's he's got the animals there at the moment. The point you just raised there about the chickens, um, he's got a couple horses, things like this. I think from my my sort of understanding at the moment, the main main points brought up was just whether I mean, on a planning side of things, obviously it sort of um, is acceptable just in terms of the principle and everything but it was really a case of saying well the distance from the shepherd's huts to the nearest property which was Kestrel Rise obviously we feel that where you saw on that photo you've got quite a large boundary you know with the trees and the fence there and uh, Rose did bring it up in her um, officer's report just in terms of the distance um, we feel the disturbance is really going to be minimal it is classified as a low scale um, tourist accommodation development um, and really the aim the aim of this application is my clients are quite keen to solve offer experiences so you know you see on airbnb booking.com that sort of thing they'd like to offer you know horse riding walks out rambling and really try and promote the area and that's sort of what they're looking to do um, so yeah I mean if, any, if there's any questions really regarding any how how stuff works in terms of the drainage, things like that, you know, um, I just wanted to be able to offer some sort of um, answers to those type of questions. Um, but in, in overall, I think it's relatively straightforward. And, you know, Rose has covered pretty much everything in, in her officer's report, which I thought was quite good. So, um, yeah, obviously, if you've got any questions further as well, I was just here to give any of those answers, really. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm going to start the questions off. Sure. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> I have two. Um, I noticed that you didn't take any pre-application advice. Was there any reason for that? Um, well, the thing was, because we spoke with initially how I got introduced to the site um, was because there's there was a confusion with Phil, who's the owner. He has a static caravan there. And what was happening was he he was starting to try to do a small holding um, and what happened was I think it was his son that was displaced from his home for a few weeks or so so he moved into the static and obviously that was against planning policy so my attention was drawn to it then um, because obviously it was an enforcement issue at that stage um, my initial application was then just to get permission for the static application uh, static caravan um, and that's how I spoke to Liz Martin at the time and I've discussed with Liz quite a few times sort of informally whilst I've been there about a few ideas of doing that um, and that's kind of what we were thinking um, obviously I knew it matched policy in terms of um, you know being acceptable in terms of principle so I knew it was sort of more a subjective type of view but um, I think you know the informal discussions I'd had I thought it seemed like it was relatively achievable anyway. Um, I just personally, I just didn't realise it was actually going to draw this much attention for such a small application, to be honest. Um, so, yeah, it was more in terms of planning side of things. I was happy. It was more a case of subjective view of, you know, uh, if, if the neighbours were sort of on board with it, really. Um, so, yeah, that was that was more the reason why there wasn't like a formal pre-application advice going through. OK, thank you. Um, well, actually, I've got probably more than one more question. Um, sure. Did, did I hear um, Liz say that there's just a single bed in the shepherd's huts or but they looked like they were larger than that? Yeah, um, basically, they're actually, it does look a little bit larger on the photos, but um, from the dimension on the plans, basically, you'd have you'd have a double bed. So the maximum and and there's not really space either side, to be honest. So the maximum people you could have on site at any one time is is four, um, which is one of the issues we were discussing with the nitrates, because where the minimum is 2.4 people, obviously, that's something we need to resolve at a later date with uh, Natural England. 
Um, so yeah, four people is the maximum you could physically get in both of them. Okay. Yeah. And just explain to me what is on site now. So you haven't got the caravan on site anymore? That's right. He's removed that. Um, yeah, that's right. So he's basically got this um, static there, which um, he's sort of, as I say, was starting of small holding. So what he was doing is do it like it was basically like a workstation, you know, like if you're doing um, it was really just to have hot water, make cups of tea, get changed and stuff whilst he was working on the field. Um, that's pretty much what it's used for now. Um, I know I think there might have I'm not sure but I think some of the points raised where they thought he might have been back there um, but what happened was he's had lambs on site and he's been doing lambing so he had to bottle feed them for five weeks so we took a motor home to the site to stay there for those five weeks whilst he was bottle feeding these lambs um, but in terms of the buildings on site you've got the static and then the second one is um, stables uh, well it's like a covering for the horses to be able to go into and have their hay and things like that so it's uh yeah it's quite minimal sort of stuff I, I, i'm struggling to understand the site really so on, yeah. on, on the plan there were two shepherds huts i thought fairly close together but you you tell me the distance between them no sorry i was referring to the shepherds huts to the nearest residential property just in terms of distance yeah. from neighbouring properties. But I'm still struggling to understand. So when on site, you'll be having yeah. chickens, which obviously we've seen running up and down the lane. Yes. Presumably. And then horses, um, which will be in the stables. And is there anything else associated with the small holding apart from what you've told us? Yeah, so this is the thing. So at the moment, obviously, as it works at the moment, they've had their horses there for quite a while um they've added chickens they've added lambs they wanted to add pigs and i think the idea is that if you could have a couple of these small tourist accommodation in that setting what i think what they want to do is offer experiences where you can sort of feed the animals see them and it can become kind of like a, a an experience when you go down there so i don't think he's particularly looking to remove the animals in place of the tourist accommodation i think he's ideally looking to join them together um, as i say probably do horse riding activities um you know rambling walks uh, so sort of incorporate the two really so last question and then i'm sorry i'm hogging the proceeding West, condition five limits the tourist accommodation <coughs> the holiday accommodation so you're the applicant is happy with that he won't be using it for lambing or whatever no that's that's yeah so that's that's absolutely correct yeah that's right just just for holiday accommodation which obviously is what the um policy by winchester you know was put in there for and that is what it is um and that's why it was so good to get the static application resolved um because now he has that place to be able to get everything ready you know use it as storage or you know and general work stuff really Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Reid, you've got your hand raised. Thank you, Chairman. Um, hello, Mr. Baxman. Hi there. Put the video on so you can see me. <laughs> thank you. Oh, what a sign. Um, <laughs> how, how many, thank you, Mr. Um, how many different plots of land are there down this lane? Uh, off the lane? Well, yeah um i think the there's a house at the entrance okay and then there's another plot just behind his and then you've got kestrel rise the other side um so i'm not sure of the exact total but in terms of houses that are immediately near the site or adjoining there's only one other um so i know they access the their house via that track um but yeah, I'm not. I know because the thing is, in terms of the track, the the um, refuge waste for Kestrel Rise, I believe, goes down that track, collects it, and then turns in Mr. Cochrane's land at the moment. Um, yeah. So that I think they're the main ones that are collected at this point. Um, but in terms of the number of individual parcels, I believe on that side it's around four or so. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Vice Chair, any more questions? Yes, we have um, questions from Councillor Raphael and Councillor McLean, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Raphael. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Paxton. Uh, a parish council say there's no suitable provision for drainage and siting of a compost toilet is likely to pollute the nearby, nearby stream. How do you answer that? Yeah, no, that's absolutely fine. So we've removed the compost toilet. The um, the further details about the drainage um, obviously we'll do as per the condition. Um, the current theory behind that is really to use a water treatment plant. Um, you know, we've used quite a few of those in the area before, personally, um, and that seems to be the best way because where the uh, shepherd's huts are sited on the land, um, it actually drains down and obviously there is a lot of land there so we can get soakaways in there to be able to run through the water treatment plant and then disperse the filtered water into the land. Um, but obviously that more detail will be um, brought up within the condition that was set out in the officer's report. Thank you. Um, Councillor McLean. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Raffel's asked my first question, but the second one I'd like to mention. You, you just mentioned in passing that the, the guys that own the place and are proposing the shepherd's huts want to do it as an experience. And you mentioned feeding lambs and such like. Now that, to my way of thinking, means or suggests it would be children doing such things rather than mums and dads, because mums and dads have sort of done all that during sure. their lives. Sure, yeah. So at the moment you're saying the chances are there will only be two occupants per hut. If the children are involved, that means there are going to be more applicants per hut. So does that mean that uh, tents could also, ancillary tents could be put up by holiday makers so they could put their children in or they'd sleep in them and the kids would sleep in the hut? So is that being considered in here at all? Thank you. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, that hasn't been mentioned and I don't think that's necessarily been a thought at all of um, Mr Cochrane. That, he hasn't certainly mentioned that to me. Um, I wouldn't imagine you are allowed to add more tourist accommodation without further planning consent, so I'm pretty sure that wouldn't be allowed. Um, I get your point about potentially it could be more of a child's activity, which does make sense. Obviously, uh, petting, animal petting, is um is probably just an idea at this point you know maybe maybe the horse riding and offering walks and other experiences maybe more along the lines of what the accommodation is actually suitable for to be honest um obviously if it was something in the future where you thought maybe it might be more suitable for children to have those sort of activities i think in reality like you say with the tents and stuff that's then going to be a further application down the line should that be you know a, a possibility um to be honest though my feeling is this is sort of like a small scale thing that they'd like to run and sort of get involved with the people for a, sh a period of time maybe during the summer and then it would be you know it's quite a small scale thing from what i've from what i understand um it's yeah. the only the only thought i have <clears throat> again your thoughts on it things evolve and if it is successful as you're proposing it and then people do want to bring their children, which I'd love to have brought my kids to somewhere like that. So, you know, I'm guessing that a lot of the people that use it would want to do the same thing. Yeah. So how is that going to be dealt with? I think that um, would be, I mean, yeah. Know, so it might not be a planning, it might not actually be a planning condition, but it's a thing, you know, we maybe take advice on from, from the service lead or from I the mean, officer. Yeah, of course. I mean, now you, now you bring it up, because obviously if you think about it, if they, if you wanted to take your family down, and you were doing like you know touch you know feeding the animals things like that um the accommodation how it's set out obviously if you had two children really it's are you comfortable to leave two children in their own unit or you know are you going to mix and match it doesn't quite work you'd almost be better to have a four-person unit together and then another four-person unit um so you're right you know um if we i think if i think the idea really was to initially start this sort of see how it goes what kind of people they would be getting what sort of experience they'd be doing um and then if they realized what you say is true i think then they would potentially need to do another application just to extend what's already there um i think that's probably going to be the process because i don't think you would be able to set up tents or get extra accommodation there um without planning i mean rose, rose may know better um whether someone could bring a tent 
for their children, but I'd imagine that's probably not allowed. Uh, yeah, in the case of families, we would assume that both huts would be hired out and you'd have two people in one and two in the other. Um, additional camping and tourist use outside of what this application has proposed would need further planning permission. Thank you. Um, any further questions, Vice Chair? Uh, no further questions, Chair. Thank you. Um, I, I've just got one more question. Sorry about this. Yes, okay. uh, the um, Shedfield Parish Council have sent us in some additional comments and um, we heard that you've shown the deeds to the City Council that the applicant has the right to use the track. According to the Shedfield Parish Council, who may be wrong, um, the applicant has the right to use it for private, but not for commercial purposes. Could you comment on that? Um, well, the uh, I got the letter from his solicitor, which I sent in, um, which said that he had full rights of way over the track. Um, so I'm pretty sure that if it wasn't uploaded, it has been submitted. And I think the highways team did actually say everything was OK um, on the officer's report. Obviously, that was um, confirmed to be fine. Um, but yeah, no, we have the solicitor's letter here, so we could send. Obviously, I can't show it, but I'll, um, ask, I'll ask the officer. I think I think on the officer's report, it was all OK. Yeah, <laughs> so I think I think that's it. Vice sure. The questions. And so thank you very much, Mr. Thank you. Yes, no problem. You'd like to turn your microphone and your video off, but of course you're very welcome to stay in the meeting. To yeah, no worries. No, that's absolutely fine. I'll just find it here quick. Um, thank you. Rose, thank you. the comments you've updated, could you update us on the um, access about not to be used for commercial purposes? So the applicant does have a right of vehicular access at upon the um, public right of way. Um, at present, I understand it is only for private use. However, if he wanted to increase that, he would need to agree that with the landowner. And that's considered to be a civil matter outside of planning. Yeah. So that's two civil matters. There's another civil matter as well. Is that just over the, my road down somewhere? Anyway, that was just over the access, access, I believe. The access has um, a civil um, civil matters. Thank you. So, members, we're going to um, go to planning considerations on page 112. Question on principle of development and design and layout. Rose, I've got a question. Um, this um, MTRA 4 allows for low key tourist accommodation that is appropriate to the site, location, and setting. Um, it's the last bit of that sentence that slightly concerns me. In your view, this application we know it's low key because it's only two, um, but it is appropriate to the site, location, and setting. Um, I did ask the landscape officer for their um, con um, opinion on this. Um, they, we concluded that because it was not highly visible from any direction, um, that it was appropriate for the location and setting. OK, thank you. Vice Chair, any further questions? Councillor Reid, you've got your hand up. Councillor Reid, do you want to ask? Thank you, Chairman. Yes. All right. Um, Chairman, this application 12 and also application 13, when I visited the sites, there was no planning notice being displayed. Can you tell me what the legal situation might be on that? There was no what? Sorry, Councillor Reid. No. no notice. No planning notices were displayed. Oh, right. Well, I actually had great difficulty finding the site because um, when there was no indication. So that could be the same thing. Yes. Right. Yeah, I will make a comment on that later. Yeah. No uh, notices on the site. Uh, thank you, Chair. So for both of these applications, we have been working 
on them for quite some time. So they would have both expired the site notices. Uh, so they were definitely put up, put up. I put them both up myself um, and the three weeks did uh, pass some time ago. So it's very likely that they were removed uh, some time ago. And we've had a number of objections from Parish Council and um, nearby residents, so they must have been aware of the application. <laughs> Councillor Bento has a question, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Bento. Sorry, yeah. Um, I do know the site because it is in my ward, so I have walked along that track. It's a very muddy track once you get into winter time. It does serve just one cottage cobwebs as well as they get down to the Kestrel Rise. That's about it. Um, the Parish Council and somebody else who's written in have raised very strong comments that which enforcement has been involved with. I'm just wondering, my question is, um, with all these enforcement issues, how does that affect our decision here on planning? I, I know they're separate issues, but if some of them are quite serious, it should should affect our decision. So I'm asking. I, I asking expect the Finnick is going to come in there about um, enforcement. Are you, Julie? Or Rose? Uh, thank you, Chair. In, in regard to the enforcement case, it's completely separate from this one. Um, so where I understand that there are some enforcement issues on the site, it doesn't hold a bearing over this application, as I understand it. OK, Councillor Bento. Yeah, not happy with that, but <laughs> I think I don't think that's, you know, that's the, the this issue is still raised that they can um, carry on doing other things. That. Yeah. Shall we move on to the next section then? Um, which would be the rest of it really, impact on character of the area, neighbouring property, landscape and trees, highways and parking, drainage and nitrates and all the other things, and then there are other conditions. Any questions on those from members? Uh, no questions presently indicated, Chair. Okay. So there being no questions. Oh, so we have Councillor Reid. Councillor Reid. Um, thank you, Chair. On page 113, um, in the, the last paragraph of landscaping, we already have permissions for equestrian uses. Um, Will this land now continue to have multi-use um, applications? I believe so, yes, councillors. So they would be continuing with their small holding as well as the tourist accommodation use on the site as well. Thank you. Any more questions? No more questions, Chair. So we'll move into debate. Any debate? Councillor Reid would like to debate, I think. Councillor Reid. Thank you, Chairman. Just very quickly, I went and visited the site. Um, I would only hope if the application is successful, they give a good map um, that goes with their prospective clients. Um, it did take me some little while to find it. It was a very, very quiet spot. Um, and I think I do have reservations, um, and that is the access, but the access has already been spoken about. My question that I was going to ask, which I no need to ask, was about the access. And whilst the landowner or the applicant has got his usage, is that usage transferable to a third party? And that's a question that obviously will have to be answered by the applicant in, in due time. Um, I am prepared to go along with the officer's recommendation. As I say, it is a very, very quiet site. Um, it would be rather interesting. And 
Yes, amusing to watch what exactly happens with this particular site. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have Councillor Gordon Smith requesting to debate. Councillor Gordon Smith. Yeah, I mean, I don't have any reason uh, for planning grounds to object to this, but I think the whole concept is completely bizarre. I mean, if you think of it, it it's very hard to find the first problem for a stranger coming there. And it's surrounded as a scrapyard on one side. Um, it's not one's idea of rural bliss for a quiet weekend. And I mean, just I think it's evident from what was being said by the uh, by the uh, proponent is that it's the thing is not being thought through at all. You know, this idea it might be a petting zoo. Maybe children will come there and, you know, there might be sheep there and there might be horses. I mean, how the whole thing is going to interact is uh, no thoughts being given to it. But it's tucked away. No one will see it. So if it, you know, I don't think there's any planning reason to object to it, but it just seems to me extremely badly thought out. But anyway, there we go. I agree, Councillor. Um, I, I agree. I, I find it a very difficult application to sort of believe in, really. Um, and the one other point that struck me, yeah. I just looked at the um, footpaths in the area. And I mean, there's, there's footpaths, there is a footpath, the right of way going past it, but it runs back into Wickham. You know, there's, you, I've seen these places advertised out in Wiltshire, you know, out in the remote areas, and you can walk for miles along uh, uh, properly delegate, uh, you know, um, proper rights of way and have a lovely time. But there somehow, I just don't think it's, I don't think we'd want to walk back into Wickham and the, the, the footpaths don't link on to other ones. Uh, anyway, I've said enough. It is quite a walk back into Wickham, in fact. Um, and as I was saying, um, I, I, I find it um, slightly bizarre as well because it's trying to be all things to all people. So yes, it would be nice to allow children to have the experience of petting the lambs and the chickens and the horses and so on. But their parents would either have to rent the two shepherd huts, because if it's a family of four, which is in the average family, or if it was a larger family, then I don't know what they would do. There's no permission for tents. And um, the tents would always have to be associated with the shepherd huts because there are no toilet facilities there. Um, and then horses, um, lovely idea, do a bit of horse riding, but of course there's no, according to um, the paragraph that Councillor Ree pointed out, um, there's no planning consent for using the horses for recreational um, in the area. Um, um, but, and it is very quiet, I don't know who would want to come and spend their time there. Um, Wickham Festival has been mentioned, so yes, that would be ideal for them because there is a walkable distance, except it's not on this year. Um, and we've got the whole history, which I know is not relevant, but we've got the whole history of things being put on site and then people not obeying the rules. So I just have in a little query in my mind as to whether We've limit, we will limit this to um, holiday people only, but I just hope that they're not used for people who say, oh, well, I've got to be there while the lambs are being bottle fed and I've lost my home and I need to live somewhere. Um, I just hope that isn't what the aim is behind it. And I'll believe that, yes, they want to um, expand the tourism and the um, access to the animals. But um, then there's all the problem over the access, which we're told is a civil matter in that they don't have permission to use the access track for commercial purposes. So I go back then to our MTRA 4 and it says it's appropriate. And that's what I've got in my mind. Is this all this appropriate? 
but I can't find any planning reasons to say no. Those are all just doubts that are in my mind, but I do hope that those doubts don't materialise. And I hope that the applicant manages to get planning permission for the track, get planning permission for, um, I don't know, can sort out how children can come on site, and um, planning permission to have riding facilities. It's just all too vague for me. Um, I haven't definitely decided to vote for it, but I probably will. Um, <laughs> is there any other Yes, Chair, we have Councillor Bentote and Councillor McLean for debate. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bentote. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm, I'm speaking as much on behalf of the Sheffield Parish Council and local people in the area because it, it's one of these ideas. It seems like a very nice idea, but it's been ill thought out, all the uh, repercussions. Um, and although they're not planning conditions, I've already um, raised the, the problems, all the enforcement issues that are associated with this. So you, it's, it's not a reason to turn down on planning grounds, but um, there are grave concerns about how this um, plot has been used over, over the years. Um, it is a long track to get to this, this site. Um, there is a footpath which curves around, which links it into Sheryl Heath. Um, but it's not not the greatest paths at all. And if, if it, you know, the, you've already raised the problem of whether it's got uh, rights, the proper rights over it for uh, commercial use. Um, uh, I, I don't think I can really support it, but I'm not quite sure why I can't support it on, on planning grounds. That's unfortunate. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Councillor McLean. My, my button finger is slowing down. Um, gosh, you're cynical, Chair. Um, MTRA4, our policy that basically is going to drive this through, um, which is our policy, as we, we're regularly told, it is our policy. Well, it's not one I've agreed with all the way through, as you well know, because I look at this and I see drainage is a plan. It's not being done as something that's actually going to happen yet. It, it will be a condition of, but we wait to see what they come up with. Um, accommodation is certainly not family friendly. If families are going to go onto that site, it's all well and good. You say a family will rent both of the shepherd's huts. Um, if these things are going to be two to three hundred pound a week, that's not um, going to happen because people will bring their tents along and the landowner won't say, I'm sorry, you can't put the tent up and put your kids in it. It's not going to happen. Um, are they going to make it adults only, which is a possibility? Can we condition that? Um, looking at, I'm not sure that we could, um, but that might be a way of overcoming the tents and the children aspect of it. Um, the also the other concern I have is that you're going to have two shepherd huts full of in a field that's going to have sheep in it, that's going to have horses in it, that's going to have chickens roaming around. Um, the only other location I know where I have, I won't name it because it would be unfair, but as th three shepherds hut that we gave permission to some years ago, there's open countryside walks, there are beautiful fishing lakes next to it, it's beautifully managed. Um, there are management huts on site so people can go and talk to someone if something's going wrong. I see none of this here. So um, I'm looking at our, at our policy, mainly MTRA4, and I don't know how it can sensibly be implemented in this one. Um, and I'm waiting for advice possibly from uh, Julie Pinnock, I guess, who can try and help me with it because I am struggling. I don't believe I want to vote in favour of it. Um. Yeah, yeah. Got dreadful noise coming with your microphone. Oh, I can't hear. Um, I, I've got no noise in this area. I can just I, my signal doesn't sound very good. But if you can hear me well enough, all I really wanted to say, I think I've mentioned this on previous applications, that many of the concerns being expressed by members seem to be about how the business will be run, um, which are related to management and marketing type of issues as to whether the business will be successful. And that's not a planning consideration. And so obviously, um, Chair, in terms of members considering this application, I would say obviously that you have to bear in mind that it is only a planning 
considerations that you should take into account in reaching your decision. Thank you. OK, thank you. Now you've turned your microphone off. The sound is gone as well. So, I Chair, can I just ask, do you mind if I ask a supplementary? No, on, do, yeah. Um, um, OK, I mentioned a couple of things in there that um, if we could get Mrs Sutherland's view on, but I mentioned drainage in there, um, which is an integral part of the application. And we're also talking about shepherd's huts that are accommodation. So if somebody brings their kids and puts tents up next to it, is that not ancillary to the accommodation and therefore part of the application? Thank you, Chair. I could just be advised. Chair, I think you're going to get my bad signal again, but I think the um, question raised by Councillor McLean in terms of drainage is dealt with in um, one of the conditions fairly comprehensively. So I don't think that um, drainage could be something that would be a reason for refusal given that condition. OK, Councillor McLean. Um, the second part of the application about tents being ancillary to the accommodation. No. Sorry, and, and the next point was, I think it was made quite clear earlier on by Rose, was that any um, use of tents on the site required to be brought in would require planning permission anyway. And I think going back to condition two, I think it's something we'll pick up on, but there are plans which are would be specified in condition two and the development has to be um, constructed or laid out in accordance with those approved plans, which clearly won't show any tents on them. So I think um, you know, that that should deal with that particular point. I mean, what I could say is that we could put an informative on to the effect. I mean, Julie might want to comment on that. We could put something on to the effect that if um, any additional accommodation, including tents or other ancillary accommodation, would require planning permission. And if that made members feel more comfortable about the application. I'm sorry, this is my one. I'm, I'm probably being a bit boring on it, but should that not therefore be if somebody does it, how are we going to know they put tents on? We're not. So should we not at this stage be putting in something, an advisory on tents or adding it, asking them to add it to the application as if they are willing to do so? And I, I guess the guy who's putting the application is still well, still watching this. Would that not be a good way to move? Chair, I think um, you're speculating now based on what's been discussed as to whether or not there may be tents on the site. It's been made quite clear that tents would require planning permission if there were any changes to the layout of the site. And my suggestion in terms of informative, um, subject to any comments Julia had, were simply just to make points to, um, to the applicant and obviously to give members some reassurance. But as I said, um, tents would require planning permission, as would any other units or additional accommodation. So the suggestion is that any additional ancillary holiday accommodation would require planning permission and that would go on as an informative if the committee agreed to that. Um, Mrs Pinnock, did you want to add anything to this debate? Uh, thank you, Chair. I think, uh, as, as you know, Councillor um, Fiona Sutherland has, has helpfully helped out on that. I think if you were minded to agree an informative, I would probably wouldn't call it ancillary. I would call it uh, other matters that may require the benefit of planning permission uh, and that, that that should be taken care of first. So it's because it's outside of the scope of this planning application. If you start calling things ancillary, um, that has a different connotation in my view. So I think we would probably say you know, other other operational development that requires planning permission uh, should be sought first. Uh, so I'm not too sure um, what will go in the informatives. What are you suggesting? Chair, I think it would be a suggestion to, as a reminder to the applicant that any other operational development that required planning permission should be sought prior to uh, undertaking that work. And we could put an example, i.e. tents or other operational works. Yes. Um, right, OK, I think probably you'll get an agreement to that for those people who are voting in favour. Agreed. Um, does anyone object to that? The, the form of words which uh, Mrs Pinnock has suggested as an informative. Agreed. It doesn't sort of solve all the question marks that we've all got, but it, I suppose it's one of them. Um, any more? Um, uh, no more debate indicated, Chair. Thank you. So we'll move to um, the vote. Um, this application is recommended for approval. 
Um, the conditions are laid out on page 115 and 116. Um, and then we've just got two informatives. Oh, no, no, we've got seven informatives, plus the addition of the one that uh, Mrs. Pinnock talked about. And I think it would be a good idea to put e.g. tense at the end of that um, so that the um, applicant is quite clear what we're talking about. Um, so over to you, Dave. So um, you can tell us how we how we should vote. You know, yeah, for and against. Jim, before Dave does that, I, I, I apologise if you did just say this, I just missed it for a moment, but we just need to add a verbal update that we need to amend condition two, because as Fiona has pointed out to us, we haven't listed the set of approved plans there. I think it, I mean, we would have done it anyway, but it's an oversight. Um, it says the following plans and it doesn't list them, Chair. We'll oh, make sure that happens. Yes. OK, yes. I'm sure there's agreement to that. Thank you, Chair. OK, Dave, over to yes, you. Yes, thank you, Chair, with those uh, updates as given. Um, in favour, Councillor Evans, could I start with yourself? Um, four, four approval. Thank you. Councillor Gordon-Smith? Uh, I'm four. I... Thank you. Councillor Laming? Four. Councillor McLean? Against. Councillor Reid? Four. Councillor Raphael? Four. Councillor Russell? Four. And Councillor Bentote? Against. So that's six, four and two against, Chair. So that um, application has been approved, subject to the additions which we've already agreed to. Um, yes, members, you. would you like um, a short break? Or would you like to carry on? We have one more. Yes, please. Pardon? A brief break, Chair. Yes, please. Appreciate it. Five, so five minutes. Nearly 22. I think the next one would go on a bit. So that it's nearly 22. So shall we say 10-2? Yeah, to that'd be good. Before. Thank okay. you. Chair, are you going to start with the next application? At 10 to 4, yeah. Yeah, I, I will get to the public speakers to come in early then. Thank okay. you. Oh, right. That's early, is it? Yeah. Well, I believe it is, but uh, yes, that's that's fine. Thank you. Yeah, but are they there? No, they're not at the moment. OK, so but we we'll... might have to wait for them. Was it? It was 4.15 that we had a sort of time against that, didn't we? That's what we approximated, but then for them to, uh, them to join the meeting at 4 p.m. All right. Go into, into the lobby. So. Uh, well, we, we, it could be that we might have to wait, but if they're there, then we'll carry on. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bento.
You're doing the rushing up, Roger.
Councillor Evans? Yes, hello. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, just to bring you up today, I've managed to speak to all the uh, representatives for the last item, uh, and they're in various stage of, stages of being able to log on and not log on. So uh, uh, I've had to inform them that 10 to would be the commencement time. So we'll just have to see if they're uh, in the lobby in a few minutes' time. But we do have to do a roll call when we join again. So uh, yeah. that will take a little, little bit of uh, a few moments to do. Thank you. Thank you. I'm back, Chair. I don't know where we are. Yes, apparently we are just waiting for a few people to log in. Oh, right. Members of the public. OK, thank you. I think there, there, there are a few. Yeah. Three. Dave? Dave? Yes, yes, Councillor Evans. Um, have we got the agent, um, Kevin Parr? Yes, we've got at the moment, yeah. we've got Kevin Parr and also the parish council representative. So we're yeah. awaiting the objector and also Councillor Clear as ward member. In fact, Councillor Clear, I can see he's joined now as well. So we're just waiting for um, the objector to, to come in. OK, Stephen Job. Yeah, Stephen Jack. I have spoken to him as, as I mentioned and uh, he's going to join. Yeah, fine. Chair, we, we have got everybody in the uh, in the lobby now, so I'm just going to let them in and then we'll do the roll call. Okay, can you tell me when we're ready to go? Afternoon, Mr. Paul. Good afternoon. Hi. Could I ask you to mute your microphone and take your video off and until it's the moment for you to speak. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Am I I'm, unmuted? Not, I'm not familiar with Teams. So. Oh, right. Well, that should be OK. Can I speak? Can I speak? Is that Mr Hollis? Yeah, my name is Mike oh, yeah. Hollis. Yes. Good I'm, Mr. Hollis. Hollis. I'm a retired I'm a retired marine engineer and a Wickham Parish councillor. OK, Mike, it's not your moment to speak yet. I'm sorry. Um, How do I know? Oh, I will tell you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I will, I will just go through um, the procedure again for the, those people, because some people who are speaking might be new to speaking either on Teams or new to speaking at all at the virtual. So have we got Councillor Clear? 
Yes, Councillor Clear is in the meeting as well. So, shall I do the roll call and uh, welcome members yep, back yep. for the break? Yes. Yep. Councillor Evans? Present. Councillor Gordon Smith? Present. Councillor Laming? Present. Councillor McLean? Present. Councillor Reid? Present. Councillor Raphael? Present. Councillor Rutter? Present. And Councillor Bentoat? Present. Yes, thank you. That's all members in the meeting again. Thank you. So good afternoon to um, those people who've just joined us. Um, you've heard the members of the committee. Um, Dave, did you just want to go through again the officers who are attending the meeting? I see we've got Sarah here as well. Yes, th thank, thank you. Yes, uh, we've got Julie Pinnock, who is a service lead for Built Environment. Uh, Fiona Sutherland as legal officer and we have Rose Lister for item 13 which is under consideration as the case officer, the planning case officer. Myself, Dave Shaw in Democratic Services in the city offices and I'm supported by Matthew Watson and for this item we've got Sarah Hayes who is from Environmental Health as well present within the meeting. So members of the public, the way it will go is that the case officer, Rose Lister, will present the item. Then we will move into public speaking. Stephen Jobs, uh, Jop, you will speak first. And then um, the parish council representative, Councillor Hollis. Then the ward, one of the ward councillors, Councillor Clear. And then the agent, Kevin Paul. And um, after, your, um, after you've spoken, it could be that the committee would want to ask you questions of clarification, but I will call upon you um, when it's that moment. So, um, as we've already said, the case officer is Rose Lister. We are on agenda item 13, case number 19 slash 02710 slash full, development of a battery energy storage facility at land off Titchfield Lane incorporating the access road, security fence and associated infrastructure for a temporary 25 year permission and the address is the land south of Ash Farm in Titchford Lane, Wickham. So um, Rose we've already seen you this afternoon um, so when you're ready we're ready to hear your presentation. Thank you Chair. Here we have an aerial view of the site. Uh, you can see the existing agricultural track here, which would form the main access into the site. The nearest neighbouring property at Ash Farm is located here. Uh, there are several public rights of way in the area. One starts just north of the access into Ash Farm and runs through um, this sink here. Uh, there is another one that runs along the River Meon here and another one that's an unofficial footpath that runs through Marsh's Copse here. Here we have the red line plan. Um, you can see the existing trees and hedge line along the road and the existing access here that is proposed to use for the site. There are 26 49 megawatt lithium ion batteries proposed, as well as ancillary buildings for maintenance and the routine running of the site. Um, here we have the proposed landscaping and additional um, biodiversity net gain features plans. Um, they show a wildflower meadow here and in pink on this side. Um, as well as additional planting and hedging to the north, east and south. Here we have some elevations and a section of the site as proposed. Um, at the bottom here are the proposed level changes. They would terrace the site to accommodate the battery so that they would sit further into the landscape. There'd be approximately one metre dug down at the top here and that, that earth would be used to build up here. 
on the lower level. And finally, we have some photos. Uh, at the top left hand site here is a view from the north of the site looking south. On the top right hand is a view looking down Titchfield Lane towards the site entrance. You can see the existing boundary treatment of trees and hedges. And at the bottom here is a view of the site from Ash Farm looking south towards the site. The recommendation is to permit. Thank you. Um, so we'll move into um, public speaking. And first up is Stephen Jupp, who is an objector and speaking on behalf of Mr and Mrs Lamb, who are residents, I believe, of Ash Farm. Mr. Jupp, could you could we put Mr. Jupp on the screen, please? Can you can you hear me? Um, yes, we can. But I just want to take off. Well, at the moment, we're looking at. Ah, there we are. We were looking at pictures of the site, and uh, I wanted to look at you. And if you wanted to put your video on, that means that we could look at you as well. It's unfortunately, for some reason, I use Teams all the time. My, it's currently saying to me there's no camera found. So oh, I have a slight dear. technical Never problem, mind. which is just typical, isn't it, for committee yeah. presentations? So <laughs> it, as, I think as long you. as you can hear me, yeah, I'll be okay to proceed on that basis. Yeah. yeah. When when you're ready, yep. um, you have three minutes. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes. Thank you, Chairman. I've been instructed by Mr and Mrs Lamb of Ash Farm, Titchfield Lane, Titchfield, to register their very strong objections to this planning application. And as detailed by the uh, case officer just a minute ago, their property comprises the land immediately to the north of the site. They have three mobile homes there and they're the only direct neighbours affected by the development. As shown in the bottom right photograph of the three photos you were just shown in the presentation, they currently enjoy an, enjoy an open aspect over this agricultural field to the south of them. And in my view, this is an intrinsic element of their enjoyment of their property. In my judgment, the proposed battery storage site will severely diminish the enjoyment of their property by the loss of out openness and the intrusive views that will result. For my client's view, the buildings are side on. So they will see two buildings side by side, each measuring 12.3 metres long by three metres high. It is also clear that this is not a site, a flat site, and section BB submitted to the council uh, makes it clear that the eastern run of batteries, so that's on the left hand side as they look from their property down, down through the, the two sections of woodland, and on that side the actual batteries will be raised up two metres, not cut into the ground. This will increase their prominence and is not acceptable at all. Whilst there is a remedial planting proposed on the northern boundary, it would take many years before it's capable of providing a screening role. The application indicates it's for a period of 25 years, so I foresee that any landscaping will be substandard and will never be sufficient during the intended lifetime of the battery units to mitigate against the adverse visual impact that would arise. Therefore, officers' argument under the heading impact on character of area and neighbouring properties is incorrect. At no point will the landscaping be of a size to better screen views during the lifetime of the development. Moreover, there's now a hedgerow which connects the two belts of trees on either side so that there would be a hedgerow with trees across the full width of the northern part of the site, which would further diminish the outlook from my client's properties. The final point I have is, that it's in, as I've made clear, it's indicated that this development is for 25 years. I must ask what happens at the end of that 25 year period? There's no planning condition requiring restoration. So will the battery units and fencing remain? Will there forever be this landscaping and this terracing in the, in the field? It would look very unnatural if the surrounding planting was left forever with nothing in the middle of it. For these reasons, I urge the committee to refuse this scheme. Thank you. Thank you very much. And there could be that some members of the committee would like to ask you 
um, a supplementary question. Sorry, I won't mute myself yet. No, okay. no. Um, Basia, any um, questions for Mr. Jock? Um, no questions presently indicated, Chair. Thank you. So thank you very much, Mr. Jock. Um, if you'd like to mute your microphone, but obviously you'll stay in the meeting. Yes, I'll. Um, yeah, have, thank you. Sorry, oh, Chair, we have uh, Councillor McLean. Oh. <laughs> we have a question for you, Councillor McLean. Thank you, Chair. Um, having sort of looked at this and given an awful lot of thought and an awful lot of time to it, my question, uh, I hope, is uh, going to be fairly easy to answer. But looking at Google Earth uh, uh, 2020, um, Ash Farm appears to be a storage site for commercial vehicles. Um, I wonder if you could possibly clarify that for me, because we're talking about the look of the area these guys are going to be looking over. Um, can you confirm it is a, a storage site for commercial vehicles for me? Thank you. Um, <laughs> OK, I had prepared on that. I'm trying to remember the history. I think to the north of their units, there was a permission for a number of vehicles being stored on there. I can't remember exact terms of it, but it was on the land to the north of their their residential units. I haven't got Google Earth up in front of me, so I can't say if that's the area you're looking at, sir. I can see upwards it's, upwards of 40 commercial vehicles stored on the side. Um, I haven't been there and looked at that particular aspect for a number of years, but um, there, there was there was an issue investigated by officers quite a long time ago on that regard. All I can say is this is Google Earth 2020. So. Yes. I, yes, I know it was investigated. I'm sure an application was submitted probably about five years ago. OK, thank you. Thank you. I think um, I could update as ward councillor, one of the ward councillors and councillor Clear might be able to um, verify this, that everything is on site now has permission. And uh, the parish council have mentioned in their report that this is an allocated um, site in the Gypsies and that's G GPG, I'm not sure. That's correct, yes, it's in the papers. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, any more questions for Mr. Jock? Um, yes, we have Councillor Laming with a question, Chair. Councillor Laming. Thank you. How close is the nearest residential property uh, on Ash, uh, Ash Farm to the proposed site? I, so I think it's in the officer report. I think it's approximately 100 metres. Thank you. Thank you. Is that it, Councillor um, Butter? Good questions. No yes. further questions, Chair. Thank, thank you. you. So thank you very much, Mr. Jupp. Um, as you were, you're muting your microphone. I will do now. Thank you. Thank you. So the next public speaker is um, the Parish Council representative, Councillor Mike Hollis. Good afternoon, Councillor Hollis. Good afternoon, can you see me? Yes, we yeah. can see and hear you. Uh, excellent. My you, name's... you have three minutes when you're ready. I am ready. <laughs> Off you go. All right, my name's Mike Hollis. I'm a retired marine engineer and I'm a Wickham Parish Councillor. Now, there's several objections made by Wickham Parish Council are before you, and I don't have time to uh, go over them again, but I, what I would like to do is elaborate on just one of them. And that's the proposal for an industrial site in a countryside location, which is contrary to a local plan policy part two, and is likely to be contrary to the local plan policy regarding development and pollution. Now, in this case, there are particular concerns regarding lithium batteries as in identified in Enzygo's planning statement, paragraph 3.4.1. Now, lithium batteries are, uh, contain a range of materials, including lithium salts, nickel and cobalt, which can be toxic and potentially hazardous in other ways. Lithium ion batteries are so fragile as to require special protection circuitry to maintain their safe operation. And you should bear in mind that with these batteries, there is a, a lot of power in a very small unit per each. 
deterioration, faulty manufacture, incorrect operation or mechanical damage can have severe effects. Short circuit can lead to rapid thermal runaway and a consequent explosion and a class D fire. Now class D fires cannot be extinguished by usual methods and require special powers, powders to be applied. Now this specialized uh, firefighting equipment is unlikely to be uh, readily available in a rural location. Now overheating or deep discharging can generate combustible gases and lethal gases and also lead to short circuit and consequent thermal runaway. Mechanical damage can lead to the ingress of moisture, which again can cause short circuit and thermal runaway. In the event of mechanical damage, toxic materials and electrolytes could escape to the environment, contaminating the ground and the groundwater, and in due course, contaminating the river Mion, which is not far distant and at a lower uh, elevation than the site. And the River Mion is a nationally important chalk stream uh, and water source, of course. Now, I do not doubt that the sponsors of this application will state that the batteries are entirely safe. But I would remind you that Flixborough was safe, and Bhopal was safe, and even Chernobyl was safe. Safe is a very dangerous word. Councillor Hollis, I'm, I'm awfully sorry, you have had your three minutes, so could you just finish your current sentence that you're on? Yes, so I've got one sentence. The proper place for potentially hazardous industrial installations is on an industrial site where the hazards can be mitigated and any accidents contained. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, thank you. And there could be questions for you from members of the committee. And I do believe uh, Councillor McLean, you have a question? Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, Councillor Hollis, good afternoon. Um, yeah. Modern battery technology, um, as in lithium technology, batteries in cars, batteries in people's homes where energy is being stored, um, companies like Tesla and the other major battery manufacturers. Do you believe that they have done the work necessary um, to enable these sorts of things to be installed? Um, in really any location. I wonder if you could answer that one for me. Thank you. Councillor Hollis, do you want to answer that? He um, appears to have frozen, Chair. Yes. Councillor Hollis, can you can you hear us? No. Um, for those listening in. Um, Councillor Hollis is not responding um, and um, I'll wait just a few seconds to see whether he will come back in but there seems some problem with his technology. It was probably a, tech, a rhetorical question wasn't it Councillor McLean anyway? <laughs> well no I really wanted to you know Councillor okay. Hollis has made a number of statements about the dangers of battery yeah. I just wanted to ask him whether he has he's obviously looked into it, but yeah. do we also not believe companies like Tesla, etc., have also looked into this? Right. Uh, well, I'm not here to answer that question. Um, That's why I asked him. Yeah, yeah. Councillor Hollis, can you hear us at all? Sometimes it helps if you turn everything off and then you come back in, but otherwise we're going to have to regrettably move on. But at least we were able to hear your statement to us. Last chance, Councillor Hollis, can we, can you hear us? Can we hear you? No. So we're going to have to move on then, I'm awfully sorry about that, to the ward councillor who wants to speak today, Councillor Clear. Councillor Clear, good afternoon. Good afternoon and thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Firstly, I wish to state that I fully support the Parish Council regarding their many concerns about this application and having read the application and looked at the site, 
I am not an expert, but I would like to ask what type of industrial battery is being used? Is it definitely lithium? Where in the report are the health and safety aspects detailed concerning <coughs> the batteries? And are they a potential hazard? As there is nothing to my mind that gives me confidence regarding the safety aspect. These are questions of great concern and I feel more has to be done to give assurances to everyone regarding the safety of the installation. The site is near a residential property and to build this storage facility would mean a massive change in the outlook and for the area in general. It has been said in the report <coughs> that there is a lack of alternative sites but that does not mean that the residential properties should be penalised and I personally do not consider 25 years to be temporary. The noise pollution, additional traffic movements in this location require more consideration. This is an attractive area of open countryside, which is such an important green undeveloped gap between Wickham, Knoll and Whiteley. I am also very concerned regarding the potential for pollution leaking into our lovely River Mean. Again, this has not been addressed in the report. Ladies and gentlemen, I then come to your favourite and mine, Policy MTRA4, Operational Need for a Countryside Location. Well, I'm sorry, but I strongly dispute that one sentence alone. Energy storage is still, I believe, relatively early in its technical growth, and I have read that observers do believe incidents are to be expected. This application, to my mind, is best served on an industrial site where controls and measures are put in place for any potential hazardous material. So if an accident, I hope, but if an accident, I hope not, but if an accident did occur, then it could be maintained properly. This application is not for a countryside location. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here today to respectfully ask you to refuse this application. And I thank you also for your time. Thank you very much. Any questions for Councillor Clear? Um, I have a question, Chair, if that's OK. Yes, yeah. Councillor Rutter. Thank you. Councillor Clear, um, what is your understanding of why it's being chosen as a site? Is it particularly close to um, a solar farm or something? I, I haven't quite worked out from the from the documentation exactly why it's going in there. Um, um, it is quite close, I believe, yes, to the so a solar farm in particular, but also, can I just say that in, all, in reference also to Councillor McLean's question he asked of the first speaker, I um, agree with what Councillor Evans said that it now has permission on the site opposite because Councillor McLean was on about several cars. And um, so that is all being, you know, authorised and that is all clear. But yes, it is quite near to a solar farm. Okay, thank you. Um, Chair, we have questions from Councillor McLean and Councillor Laming. Yes, and just as an addendum to the last question, it is actually also very near the national grid, which is, you know, what the, the wish of the applicant is, as on the other side of the road. Um, Councillor McLean. Um, thank you, Chair. Hello, Councillor Clear. How are the kittens? I would rather not tell you, but it's really <laughs> could I remind morning. you this anyway, that's the clear. Um, not a personal if we for a second um, set aside um, the issues of the safety or not of the batteries, which are the, that's a question we'll ask for the people who are going to be installing it. Um, you talk about MTRA4 and the sentence you picked out. Is this the right place to install it? And I wonder, could you expand a little bit on your comments there? which I think are actually quite important in this. Is it well, a place to install? Thank you. MTRA4. Operational need, as I said, for a countryside location. 
it's quotes, and we all know, such as agriculture, horticulture or forestry. So sorry, no way. The reuse of existing rural buildings for employment, tourist accommodation, I'm sorry, doesn't go under, this is not MTRA4. Um, everything in MTRA4 is not right for this. It's against MTRA4, this whole application. Everything listed in MTRA4. That's my main policy I'm quoting. Thank you, Councillor Clare. Thank you, um, Councillor Laming. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Clear, how narrow are the roads around that area? Could you get a large vehicle in? I think Titchfield Lane in that area, it's you have to drive with very, very carefully. Don't go too fast. People do at times. We all do, I'm sure. I don't, but other people do. No, uh, big lorries, not a good road for good big lorries. So you wouldn't be able to get a fire engine down there very quickly, is that what well, you're you, saying? Well, you, you could, uh, Councillor Laming, but um, it would be, you'd have to be very careful down that road. Thank you. Not a good road. Thank you. Any further questions for Councillor Clear? Um, no further questions, Chair. Thank you. Um, now, um, a, a question for Fiona, our legal advisor. I did see the parish council representative um, flash up on my screen, but um, I, th I think he's probably missed his slot at answering questions. Is that correct? Chair, I don't see any reason why the question couldn't be asked of him now. He, he, it has some, um, you know, it, we've really only got one person beyond that, and it does give, still gives the applicant a chance to comment yeah. on everything they're here. Okay. So I don't think there's any problem with that. So I'll, I'll go back to you, Councillor Hollis. You were asked a question from, can you, can you hear me? Can you speak to us now? Oh no, you're still frozen, are you? Yes, Councillor Hollis is still frozen. So we won't be able to get your answer, Councillor McLean, unfortunately. Um, so we'll move on to the final public speaker of the afternoon, which is the supporter, Kevin Parr. Good afternoon, Mr. Paul. Let me just unmute and uh, turn my camera on. Is that OK? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, I'm seeing okay. you. Yes. OK. okay. You okay. have um, three minutes when you're ready. Thank you. Um, firstly, thank you for the opportunity to, to speak to the committee. Um, I think a fundamental point for us and recognition of um, the location is that this application is for a, a temporary development. Um, of a period of 25 years, as, as previously stated. Um, we've worked very closely um, with the authority and with the planning offices and your technical um, offices over the last nine months to address the concerns uh, that have been raised both on this uh, committee and as part of the uh, consultation response. Um, in light of that, we amended the landscape screening to take on board uh, the comments raised uh, in connection with uh, the residents of Ash Farm. Uh, we have uh, increased the planting to the north of the site and indeed created a link between the uh, tree canopy along Titchfield Lane down to the existing woodlands um, to the east. That creates a link and has added uh, increased ecological benefit and we worked closely with your ecology officer and have now been able to demonstrate net biodiversity gain as part, part of the development. From our point of view, this facility will uh, help to contribute significantly to um, stability within the electricity national grid. It will also allow the transition from uh, centralised uh, power generation to decentralised uh, power generation in the form of, of solar and wind and is an important balancing uh, tool within the UK network as recognised by government and, and industry. The storage facility can be uh, immediately responsive to needs within the system. It draws down power uh, during uh, low terms of uh, requirement and is able to immediately provide balancing in higher peak times. 
from our uh, point of view, um, we, we believe that uh, the development being of a temporary nature, um, and we are uh, prepared and it, and, it, and it is noted that we uh, would expect a planning condition to remove the plant and equipment at the completion of the development. And we're, we're, we're happy to, to accommodate such a condition if it was deemed appropriate, because it is a temporary nature. It's not a permanent development, it's temporary. The development will have virtually no traffic, will have a six month construction period. It will have uh, eight to 10 vehicles delivering during that construction period. And once constructed, we'll have one or two visits per fortnight. The proposal provides for protection of the trees along uh, Titchfield Lane so that boundaries are protected. And also, we, we note that we work closely to ensure there are no noise impacts from this development and we have no outstanding technical objections from consultees. We would hopefully see the benefits in this scheme. Thank you very much. Um, and well, time, you've used your three minutes. Thank you. Um, um, could I just start the questions off to you? Um, I, I did ask where the national grid was because that's... Yes. That's the need, isn't it, to be near the national grid? And I have found out where it is. It's on the other side of the road in, in proximity. But how far away from the national grid can you be? Because the suggestion that you could have gone to the solar farm or Lavies Lane, they are further away from this site, aren't they? So uh, how far can you go from the national grid? It, it, it entirely depends upon the uh, network system in the area. We're about um, a thousand metres and the reason that we're not closer with this facility is that the Botleywood GSP is located within the Botleywood Triple SI. Um, highly protected area. Um, there is no opportunity to, to get close to that facility. Uh, we have looked at alternative sites. We have spoken with the Forestry Commission, but there's a lot of night jar and other protected species in and around that woodland, and it is just not uh, practical or possible to, to have a location uh, adjacent to the substation, which would be our preferred choice. The solar farm could be a similar distance to us, but of course it's a consented development and there's not sufficient footprint outside the landfill footprint because that land has all been landfilled and and is subject to to settlement etc and also uh, the industrial estate has not got land available that uh, was made available to us for this development so we look to locate on a on a site uh, in a temporary nature that we could um, develop into the uh, into the locality with appropriate improvements and enhancements for ecology and landscape to ensure that our temporary use is not an unacceptable impact. Thank you. Um, and um, you didn't quite answer my question as to how far away could you do, could you be? I understand the problem of where the national grid is. I, I understand the yeah. topography. Uh, how, how far how could you? Yes, could it's you completely dependent, sorry, uh, Councillor Evans, on, on really uh, the economics of the development. Um, we have facilities that are uh, more than a kilometre away. We ideally would not want to be any further than what we're away now. Ideally, we would like to be uh, closer to the facility. The connection at Botley enables us to, to bring forward this development. Um, we certainly wouldn't want to be significantly further away from Botley than where we are now. Thank you. And a final question about noise. Yes. Now, we have in our report, and we we have got our environmental health and, um, expert with us today, that in times of emergency situation, the noise levels may become adverse to um, ash farm. But you were saying in your presentation that there wouldn't be any noise. Uh, the the uh, the noise associated with the with the development in. Uh, almost all operational circumstances, excluding emergency, is acceptable, is my understanding from uh, our noise consultant and discussions that, that we've had with your, with your noise officer. In situations of emergency where, um, for example, the recent situation uh, in Lincolnshire where um, an offshore wind farm and indeed a CCGT 
um, power station lost power simultaneously and it knocked out quite a bit of south quite a bit of uh, the midlands quite a bit of east anglia and indeed down as far as uh, somerset um, was was blacked was blacked out in those situations then the battery system would be able to kick in immediately to balance that situation but it would be only be in situations like that that it would ever need to work outside normal operating hours during the day it's possible and we have to say that and we have to we we can't we can't not say that because the battery system there is to balance the system and when needed yeah. it needs yeah. to balance the system so high peak demand times which is morning and evening i understand um there would not be noise associated with that no, the, 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 the reports have identified that during those periods there, there are acceptable uh, noise emissions within the usual uh, British standards requirements for operation of these types of facilities. Okay. It, it is, it is, it is um, a, 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 a midnight night time operation where um, the background level is very, very low. If it was required in those emergencies, there may be a short term period but as I said, it would be emergencies and brownouts only. OK, and what sort of noise would it be? A hum? Uh, it's it's typically a typically a tonal hum. I mean, the main noise associated with the facility is is the air cooling for the for the batteries. Um, those uh, only operate uh, typically at temperatures above 30 to 35 degrees centigrade and um, Obviously, in the UK, that's not that often, although we had a period over the last few weeks. For the majority of the time, the batteries sit most comfortably to operate between 25 and 28 degrees. So there is no need for major cooling. Um, and have you actually tried out the noise? Because in the track going down um, past Ash Farm, there is the clay pigeon chute, which has permission to shoot on occasion certain yeah. occasions and that noise can be very loud even in Wickham which is you know some this is Wickham but right in the village of Wickham so have you tried out the noise that is likely to come um, on normal operation high peak times um, in that site yes I mean what 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 we do and and, and hopefully your 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 EHO may comment and hopefully not disagree is that we, we we do a background noise survey and on this site we did an extensive background noise survey to establish the noise in the locality and then from the uh, specification associated with the the batteries and the facilities we then create what's called a noise model to demonstrate what the anticipated noise noise levels are with the facility and they are within normal uh, accepted criteria during normal operation hours. Thank you very much for the information. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, there could be other questions as well. From okay. other questions. Yes, Chair, we have questions from uh, Councillor Raphael, Councillor McLean, Councillor Bentoat, Councillor Gordon Smith, and from Councillor Reid. Thank okay. you. Right, so we'll start with Councillor Raphael. Thank you, Chair. Uh, batteries are where out. What's the estimated uh, life of these batteries? And um, when they've worn out, what do you do with them? Uh, they'll probably anticipate that, that they'd be needed to replace at least twice during their, their operational life. Um, clearly, they are um, removed on a, on a rolling um, basis. It, it, it's probably helpful just to take this opportunity to make the comment um, about the way in which the site is designed. It's designed in individual containers that are separated um, by at least one and a half metres in order that they are self-contained within their own metal contained units. So that minimises the, the, the issue with regard to um, potential health and safety issues. Those containers are fully lined, fully secured. Um, they have battery management systems within the uh, individual containers, they have venting systems. Um, if there was a, a shortfall, there's an automatic shutdown of the individual containers. And if there was um, an issue, and, and, and there, there could be, um, we could have a faulty battery, as was outlined earlier, that could cause an initial problem, then we would completely be able to isolate each individual unit. And obviously, at that point, um, we would then 
work with health and safety and other relevant parties to deal with it. Whether this site was located on agricultural land, like we've, we've got consent and developments elsewhere, or whether it's uh, on an industrial unit or a commercial unit or linked to a, uh, an office development to provide you know, in-house in power, it's exactly the same situation. And, and we, we would manage those um, and deal with them that way. But from, from, from that point of view, um, that, that would be how we would deal with it. And, and disposal? Disposal would be um, collected via uh, an appropriate licensed uh, uh, waste management organisation, a uh, duty of care with duty of care, appropriate carriers, license, etc. Um, would be taken away potentially for reuse. I can't guarantee it would go for reuse. If not, it would go for safe, appropriate um, disposal. I think that uh, over time, uh, batteries are evolving, as we all know, and, and there may well be some way of recovering some of the elements from those batteries in time. One would hope so, because it's a, it's a life cycle criteria. But either way, we would either have a dedicated collector appropriately licensed to take away the recycle or they would be disposed of appropriately. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor McLean. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, good afternoon. A um, couple of questions. The first one is really picking up on something that Councillor Hollis asked earlier um, and was unable to respond. But I just wonder, who are you using as the, you're giving lots of te or sort of semi-technical data on the batteries that you're using and the lifespan and the cooling and the noise. But my question is, whose batteries are you using? You must have made a decision where to get them from. So where are you getting them from? We're, we're looking to... Um we're down to two parties now, if we're absolutely honest. Um, we're down to BYD, um, which is a worldwide well-known uh, significant producer of, of lithium-ion batteries. Um, and possibly there's uh, a supplier through Samsung, who we'll have heard of, and, and SMA. Uh, we are probably looking to, to go forward with BYD. Right, and if I could therefore, um, if I may share with your um, perseverance, the companies that you're going with, or sorry, suggesting you'll almost certainly go with, do they have a 100% safety record? Uh, they, they, they have a uh, well-established and proven safety record. I can't say whether it's 100% if I'm absolutely honest, but I think that with anything, um, the, these battery installations would be installed by an appropriate um, independent, qualified, proven uh, electrical contractor. So it wouldn't um, be yourself doing the installation? You'd no, we, we, we're, it would be a specialist appointed electrical contractor. Okay. This so, is I know of two of, the, two of the companies you're talking about. I don't know about the third one. Yeah, um, the second part of the question, third, is cooling equipment. These yeah. things, as you've rightly said, generate an awful lot of heat. Um, when you have a, a simple inverter installed in a house with a battery, they still generate heat. So you, you talk about having cooling equipment in the um, containers. Um, how noisy in terms of decibels is the cooling equipment in there? Because it will be running all the time. It always has to. It, 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 won't, it won't be running necessarily all of the time. I mean, I mean batteries don't, don't like low temperatures. They certainly don't like to be below zero degrees. They, 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 won't, they won't work and they'll start to have operational problems. So. Um, I think from our point of view, um, they are about 75, 80 dB at one, one, one meter, something like that. Um, the, the, cool, the, cooling, the cooling system will um, provide adequate for what we need in normal operating processes. OK, and finally, for one more, if I may, are you being direct fed from solar farms or are you only being direct fed from the grid? We're, we're only being direct fed from the grid, hence why we need to be proximate um, to the grid to the grid to get our get our appropriate connection. OK, um, thank you very much. That's great. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bentert. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Um, good afternoon. Follow on really from the original question by Councillor Evans about the siting of this uh, um, unit. Um, why does it have to be in this area? Obviously, the national grid is 
everywhere. So why are we looking at something in this area when there must be many other sites anywhere in the southeast or anywhere, as you, you say? Um, that's what concerns me. We seem to be picking something in our countryside area and perhaps other sites are further away will be really suitable. I, I think it really comes back to the, the, the point that was made earlier um, associated with the, the proximity to to the substation. As, as we know, there are many, many um, substations around the UK, as you say, all over the country in the northwest and the northeast and the south and southwest and, and, and Hampshire, etc. Um, but what there isn't is necessarily availability of capacity at that grid substation to enable you to install a battery energy storage facility. Just because you have a, a substation, um, and it could be any form of different size of substation, doesn't uh, ensure that you have capacity available at that location to connect um, either a generating facility or a facility like this, which is an import export facility. So we need both the incoming power and the exporting power. They are um, tend to be associated with larger substations, like the Botleywood substation is. Um, as I explained earlier, there is no opportunity to um, go in close proximity to the substation because it is protected land and it is um, solid spatial scientific and interest, etc. So we were we are looking with this location to be as close as we physically can be with a an accepting landlord, an acceptable site, on the knowledge that this is a temporary development. It is not a permanent development, it's a temporary development. We've looked at um, other locations in the locality. The landfill site is, is already committed to a, a solar development and there's not sufficient space available for us for our development. And this is the nearest available site that we're able to identify. Right, okay, I'll take your word on that, all that. Um, are there any security aspects that need to be involved in the site? I, from obviously the site will be um, suitably fenced with a with a with a with a with appropriate fencing um, and uh, it will be remotely monitored 24 7 seven days a week both in terms of of, of operation and CCTV um, I guess uh, if you have a facility with any of these types of development um, then there's always a risk of security, but it will be appropriately fenced, appropriately locked. It will have security guard um, uh, monitoring and, and it will have CCTV. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then I believe Councillor Gordon Smith, your question has been answered. I saw on chat. Yes, Chair. Uh, so yes, it has, that's fine. It was about noise. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And um, Councillor Leeming, did you want to ask a question? Or not? Yes, please. Um, I'd like to ask three, actually. OK. Uh, the first one's relatively simple. How many units have you built and have got running in the country at the moment of this type of battery storage? Uh, this type of battery storage, there are uh, a number of developments uh, around the UK um, at various stages of development. I believe there are now in excess of, 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 of 40 developments in the stage of construction or operation. No, I mean, you, you, your company itself. Our, our, our company, we're working with a, uh, a partner who will um, build, own and operate this facility. They have an operating facility in Somerset and they have a facility that they're just progressing um, in Fairham uh, at uh, Stroud Green. OK, thank you. Just that we'd like to get some idea of um, how much knowledge they've got in this particular area. Yes. Um, now, conditions for the end of life. Um, you were saying you're quite happy to have something conditioning on yes. that. Yes. Now, does that include removing all the foundations and everything else? Yes. Happy that? We're, happy to, we're happy to remove the foundations um, uh, probably down to, to half a metre below the ground or whatever um, the authorities see. Um, as appropriate, yes. I mean, we would we would move the remove the foundations to allow to allow a surface. Yeah, I mean, how deep would the foundations be? I mean, it's just just sitting on a on a on a concrete plinth. We wouldn't see them going down more than half a meter. Okay, that's fine. That's 
fair enough. And we've heard some concerns from the local uh, parish councils about if there was a fire, there would be some runoff. And bearing in mind that we're near the River Meon, uh, would you be putting in barriers to stop runoff going away from the site? So it's each, contained? Each, each individual um, container is, is, is fully self-contained and sealed. Um, we uh, would not expect any leakage to come outside that container in any way, shape or form. The, the lithium batteries are not liquid, they're like a paste, mm -hmm. like, a, like, a, like a solid paste. Um, yes, they will burn, and if they do start burning, you almost certainly have to let them burn out. That's why you have them in individual containers rather than crammed together in a very, very large building. So we would see the containers as being um, totally self-sufficient, sealed, and and effectively a bonded unit for any um, associated runoff. But as I said, it's a paste; it's not a liquid. It won't run. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Um, it's a question of public confidence as well on yeah. this particular yeah. thing, and you're going to have to put some form of cooling on the surrounding containers. Yes, and your absolutely. Third question, your third question. Absolutely. That's, that was the third one. All right. <laughs> Okay, you finished, have you? Yes, thank you very much. Vice Chair, any more questions for um, Mr. Carl? I believe um, Councillor Reid has a question, Chair. Councillor Reid. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm sure Mr. Parr is now fed up with batteries. Um, Absolutely. What not. I will say is that I've got a system near me, Love Dean, which is having the same similar type of construction made. Mr. Jupp, um, who was representing Mr. and Mrs. Lamb of Ash Farm, was concerned about the landscaping. Yes. Um, it was, and it is agreed, that landscaping takes a while to grow. Um, would you be averse to a more matured landscaping on the northern aspect of the site? which would obviously shield the um, view, direct view, by Mr and Mrs Lamb. I know that in the UK law, we don't have a right to a view. However, a, a mature planting on that northern boundary would help, um, I'm sure, make the thing more acceptable to Mr and Mrs Lamb. Yes, I, 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 I think that's a, a reasonable um, request uh, Councillor Reid and I think that in light of the ongoing concerns um, despite the fact that we, we, we have increased the, the landscape planting and and the landscape officer is, is, is happy I think we would be agreeable to some some enhanced um, larger planting along that boundary by agreement with your with your with your with your landscape officers to to give early screening we would agree that so if that was put into wording within the condition, you'd be more than happy. Yes, we would. We would agree. That. Thank you, Mr. Jar. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Vice Chair, any more requests to ask questions of Mr. Paul? No, I think I think we've grilled him for long enough. <laughs> Well done now. Thank you, Mr. Paul. Thank you so much for coming along this afternoon. You've no, it's gathered. Fine. A new technology for us. Yes, absolutely. You've been very patient in answering all our questions very professionally, and we do appreciate it. So thank you for coming along. Um, if you'd like to um, just mute your microphone and take your video off, but of course you're very welcome to stay to the rest of the um, application. Thank you for the um, opportunity to speak. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Hollis, could I ask you to take your video off, or is that not possible? Thank you, lovely. Um, so, um, Rose, anything you'd like to add in the light of what you've heard from the public speakers? Um, just that we can include a restoration um, condition as well. Uh, I believe Julie's got a suggested wording that she can okay. circulate for you. Good. Yeah, I was going to request that. And then we've also heard the bit about planting on the northern boundary, but presumably that won't be in a condition, but we'll come to that in a minute. 
Oh. We have condition 13, which we could um, include that in as well, Councillor. Um, right, so this is, um, sorry, new, now on the screen, we've got new number. So on the, on the screen is a example condition that has been previously used for another application. Yeah. So yeah. this is just the wording that we are proposing for an additional um, yeah. condition. Uh, forming number 16. Oh, it would be number 16, yeah? Yes. Um, members, um, I'll give you just a minute to read that through. For those that are listening, um, it says that um, once it's, the facility ceases in 25 years um, from the date of the electricity being imported and exported to the grid, after that, in 25 years, the equipment shall be removed from the site, land restored to its former use as agricultural land. The scheme has to be submitted and approved in writing with the local planning authority. Um, has to be submitted no later than three months prior to the cessation date. And it will have details of the proposals for the removal of the perimeter fencing, all structures, cabling, underground features within the site. In the event that the site fails to operate for a period in excess of six months, then the restoration phase shall be triggered unless it's been given written consent from the local planning authority. Um, I, I agree. Think, yeah, I think that covers all. Yeah, all that. The so that would be agreed as a new condition 16. Um, and let's go then to the um, report. Um, shall we have then um, questions on page 129, principle of development and design and layout. Any questions on those two items? Chairman, my hand is still up. Um, yeah, I didn't good. take it down, but I want to only put it back up again. If I okay. may, Chairman, how does this or how will this affect the gypsy traveller? Um, where are we? So I've got to read the words. How will this affect the land supply for the gypsies and travellers in the area? Uh, thank you, Chair. It, it wouldn't, Councillor. Um, the land at Ash Farm is a separate site which is protected under our um, gypsy and traveller DPD. Um, and this is not um, part of that land. It's a separate application with a separate red line. It's not associated with the gypsy and traveller site at all. Thank you, Rose. Thank you. Any further questions on, on that, those two headings? Councillor McLean has a question, Chair. Councillor McLean. Thank you, Chair. I think this is the right place to ask the question, but um, Winchester City Council has been making, um, or, or has declared that the, the climate agent, that the climate emergency and dates to um, target ourselves for being effectively energy neutral. Um, will this application or this uh, battery site have any bearing on our um, target dates? Will it bring things forward or will it make any difference at all? I wonder if I could ask that one, probably of our um, environment person. Thank you. Who's going to answer that? Uh, we could try asking Sarah, she may know more. Hello Chair, um, it's not actually environmental health, it would be for the um, sustainability team to answer that question. Um, I, it's not, from my layperson's view, it's not generating any renewable source, is it? So I would have assumed it would be fairly neutral, um, but that's my layperson's opinion, um, but I'm, I'm not really the right person to answer that. Okay. Chair, would it be reasonable to ask for a response to that question? Because if we're storing battery power to feed back into the grid in an emergency situation, that must have some bearing on um, our target figures, I would have thought. Chairman, if with your permission, I might say that we can't muddle up the Council's climate declaration with our duty as a planning authority to make a planning judgment on this case. And I think, you know, that, that is separate and we, we have got a decision to make here today uh, with a recommendation to approve. And I don't think this, you know, is something we can factor into our own climate declaration, Chair. OK, thanks for that. 
So any further questions on? Um, uh, Councillor Councillor Reid has his hand up still. I don't know if this is a new question no, or. It's not still. It's not still. I'll put it out and then put it back up again. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Chairman, on Councilor page one two nine. On page one two nine, Hampshire Countryside Services. No comment received. Should we be concerned about that? I don't believe so, Councillor. I asked them in relation to the um, public rights of way in and around the site. Um, I went out myself and I couldn't see the, the site from any of them. And I assume that not having a comment, they agreed the same conclusion. Thank you. I think there is a possibility you will you won't be able to see it from the road because it is already um, quite well screened, and there is a there are proposed proposals for additional planting. But I think there will be long distance views of it. The, it there's a potential for longer distance views. I couldn't find them myself when I was out on site looking at the site from the various um, rights of way. Um, however, there are unofficial footpaths within the um, marshes sink to the east of the site. Um, so people walking towards the edge of the sink might be able to see them. Um, other further long distance views, it's screened by the sink in the area. So um, most long distance views, I don't think would be impacted by the proposal count, Chair. Thank you. So we'll move on then, shall we, to the next issues of impact of character of the area and the neighbouring amenity. Um, we could discuss trees, ecology and highways and parking as well. But all those issues really at the end of the report. Can I ask about the biodiversity? I've somehow got written down that there is no increase in the net biodiversity. And then I heard something different from Mr. Poor. Could somebody answer that? Uh, the site is considered to be a priority habitat, councillor. Um, therefore, in order to get biodiversity net gain, it would be difficult. Um, they have in included a scheme of um, enhancements, including the wildflower meadow, um, additional hedging and trees, as well as um, bird, dormouse and bat boxes. Um, so that would offset some of the impact of the development on the ecology of the area. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Vice Chairman, any further questions on those issues? Um. I don't think so, Chair, no. No, I think we probably um, wore Mr. Um, Parr out with our questions and asked all our questions of him. Um, so then we'll move on then to um, debate. Um, debate. Shall I no. start? No debate. Oh, we have Councillor Reid, Chair. Councillor Reid, yeah. Someone's got to start, so let's start. Yeah. Um, Chairman, I've, I must admit I've read this one. My concern was about the gypsies and how this would affect. Luck, luckily, I've been um, proven that it's it won't affect that particular land usage. Um, with regards to the re uh, returning the site after the 25 years. Um, we've now dealt with that or will be dealing with that with a condition and we will be altering con condition. I think it was 11 or 13 with regard to mature landscaping in front on the northern edge of the uh, of the site. Um, I can find no planning reason not to go along with the officer's recommendation. Therefore, I would be in support of this particular application. Thank you. I will go next. Um, this is country, countryside councillors, um, and you saw the open aspect of it, and it is in close proximity to a triple SI, 
marshes plantation, marshes cots. It's on a slope going down to the river Meehan. Um, and there's another cop, Stonyfield Cops there. And I do understand and I did appreciate Mr. Parr's very um, full description of the need, but surely this should be on uh, an industrial site, not in the middle of the countryside, just because they can't find another industrial site. Now, Ladies Lane, which was mentioned, which is an industrial site down um, Pitch Road Lane on the other side of the road, the units there come up with great regularity. So I really can't understand the urgency of putting this quite large facility in the middle of the countryside. It's just totally against MTRA4 and I just can't support it. I've, I've gone into it in great detail and I've purposely kept away from it because the parish council have been so opposed. But you're going to be able to see it in long distance views. There are 26 batteries and we saw the view originally from Ash Farm and then we saw, you know, they're going to be looking at it end on and then it's going to be, um, the batteries are going to be raised up by two metres. So really intrusive for um, Ash Farm and then there's a possibility, they're fairly near, they're not very near, but they're fairly near and then there's the possibility of um, intrusive noise and we're told oh well it won't happen but all emergencies are not meant to happen but they do happen and I cannot support the loss of their facilities and their amenities and the fact that they will hear this um, sort of this battery farm. Um, I just did just wrote a few notes as we went along yeah, I'm pleased to hear that there's not going to be a lot of traffic using Titchford Lane. Yeah, there is a weight limit on it and anyway, and um, traffic is very fast and it's this sort of winding lane. It is a lane. It used to be uh, someone I know used to wheel their pram down there, but you wouldn't dream of doing it now. Um, so in all those reasons then, A, that it's countryside, it's it's contrary to policy MTRA4 and that it doesn't need to be there. It could be somewhere else. Somewhere else, you know, you could draw an arc around the national grid and find another more suitable site. I really can't support this as being a suitable site for this facility. But I shall not be voting for the application. Any more um, contributions to debate, Vice Chair? Yes, we have Councillor Gordon Smith, Councillor Laming, Councillor McLean, and uh, Councillor Reid. Oh, Councillor Reid's already spoken, I think, is he? He's still got his hand up, so. I have, Chairman. It's my miss. I forgot to put my hand down. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Reid. Sorry, okay. my mistake. Not Councillor Reid. Councillor Gordon Smith. Uh, yes, well, I'm not sure on, on, on planning grounds. I mean, we're we're told that we judge things as as they are submitted, and the fact that it could be put somewhere else, uh, we you could say that of practically everything. Um, I, I've, I've looked at the landscape, and I think they've done a pretty good scheme, and I think it's pretty well hidden. There's quite a dense hedgerow along the roadside. There's woodland on the other side, and uh, to the south. There's another neck of woodland quite close to, and I, I, I'm, I find it slightly strange that Ash Farm complains about a loss of view. When uh, when I was there the other uh, yesterday, there was something like 30 cars parked all around there, so I would doubt they can actually see very much. But I think their complaints could be taken care of by planting some uh, large uh, semi-mature hedgerow, not little forestry whips, but a, a decent beech plant, uh, one and a half metres high. So I, I see no reason to uh, vote against this scheme. Thank you. Councillor Leeming. Thank you, Chair. It is a very difficult decision this particular one, uh, particularly with the 
response from the parish council and that. One of the problems you have with these battery storage uh, facilities is they have to be near a certain type of or certain power substation, which limits the number of places they can go. And as we go over onto renewables, we're going to need more and more of these. So that gives us that quandary. Um, I do think that what we've heard today uh, allays quite a lot of my fears in terms of returning the land to uh, agricultural land at the end of life. And they're looking at uh, doing the boundaries to alleviate a lot of the problems. Um, so I should listen to what others have got to say before I actually make my mind up on this. Vice Chair, any more contributions? Um, I believe we have Councillor McLean still waiting to speak, Chair. Councillor McLean. Councillor McLean. Can you hear me, Councillor McLean? Yeah, it's a joys of teams. Um, we are regularly um, told by yourself and our uh, leads in planning that we should listen to our own policies, part of the policy MTRA4. Um, I think on a, on, a, on a personal level, is it the right place? Um, I think it probably isn't, but we have a policy that we are being told we should, we should follow, which is policy MTRA4. Um, batteries, we, there is a lot of concern about the safety of batteries. Um, having just, while we've been talking, I just had a quick look on the website to see what the safety records for these sorts of battery was. Um, there are no, we could, no recorded incidents. Um, so again, that puts my mind at fear about that one. Um, and as far as noise from these um, batteries is concerned, there's a clay pigeon shoot about 150 odd yards just down the hill from where it's going to be sited that will produce an awful lot more noise than um, some cooling fans on some batteries, which are inside the, uh, inside the containers, I think we've been told. So again, I will listen to what other councils have to say, but at the moment I'm coming down in favour of the application, but I will listen to other uh, members if they have anything to say. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Vice Chair, any more contributions to debate? Uh, no, Chair, no more contributions. Thank okay. you. So in that case, um, we will move to the vote. Before we do that, um, we did, we've already agreed an extra condition 16 about restoring it after 25 years. Um, and then we've had a promise from um, Mr. Parr over improving, enhancing the landscape to the north of the site. I can't see anywhere that that could go in the condition. Or do we just take that as read from Mr. Parr's promise? Or do we put it in Jim. as an informative? Chairman, the officer did say that it could go into um, 13. OK, with your permission, with your permission, I was going to summarise, Chen. You've nicely done that on um, the additional okay. conditions that I showed you. Do summarise anything I haven't said. Oh, no, no, you've, you've, as I say, you've summarised that very well. I was just going to add that with condition 13, uh, it, it talks about no development shall take place until details of both hard and soft landscaping works have been submitted to and approved in writing by the local planning authority. And I thought we could add there, including mature planting on the northern boundary. And then we can approve those details for our conditions, subject to them being acceptable. But we're very clear in that condition that that's what we're expecting, Chair. Okay, so is that um, agreeable to the committee? Agreed. Very strongly agreed about mature planting, yes. Yeah, agreed. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Thank you. So I think we're in a position um, to move to the vote. This application has been recommended for approval, um, subject to the conditions on page 132, 133, um, and 134 and 135. We have a new condition 16, and we're adding in mature planting in uh, condition 13 and there are informatives on page 135 and 136. 
and um, I will pass now the um, task over to Dave to take the roll call of how members are going to vote. Yes, thank you again, Chair. Um, first of all, yourself, Councillor Evans as Chair. Against. Councillor Gordon-Smith. For. Councillor Leeming. For. Councillor McLean. Or. Councillor Reid. Or. Councillor Raphael. Or. Councillor Rutter. For. Councillor Bentoad. Sorry, I didn't have my mic on. Against. So that's six members for and two against. So that um, application is permitted. Thank you very much, um, members of the public, for coming along today. And if I could ask you um, to, unless you wish to study for planning appeals, which is the next item, 14, um, to um, leave the, the meeting. Thank you very much, Rose. Had a hard day. And thank you, Sarah, for coming along for the environmental health issues. So we move to agenda item 14, um, which is the planning appeals. Over to you, Julie. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I always try and promise to bring you these as, as quickly as we can. And we have now caught up, haven't we? Because we're just very much uh, in the last quarter, which brought us April till June. Um, I think members may recall when I brought the last quarterly report, because of COVID, the planning inspectorate had got a little bit behind. And I think that reflects that we've only had five decisions in this period. So I would expect um, you know, an, a slightly higher number in the next period. But what, you know, I mean, I know statistics, um, you know, it depends on the volume, but we had five decisions here and it was an 80% uh, an success rate. So one out of the five was allowed. Uh, corporately, we have a, a, a key performance indicator where we try, you know, the, the norm is to win about 70% of appeals. Uh, so obviously very happy in this course. I think I've said to you before, it does, we, we measure it over a rolling two year period. Um, because that gives you a more accurate sort of measure of that success. Now, I'm happy if you'd like me to, to go, you know, because there are only five, I could go through them individually. Now, I did make a few notes. So on item one, uh, obviously, it we were pleased that that appeal was dismissed. It was an application for um, uh, a student uh, unit with seven occupants. Uh, we've got a policy win nine that we've um, with an article four direction and we fought hard to defend that. Now, this was a joint enforcement and development management appeal and both were upheld. Uh, the inspector concluded that you know, this proposal would add to the concentration of HMOs. Um, it would um, result in an imbalance to the housing mix, which is what our policy looks to achieve. It could increase noise and impact neighbours. So there was a, a six month compliance period on that chair. So that was a, a successful appeal uh, in our view. The next one was obviously disappointing. This was the one that was allowed. It was a tricky one. It's Meadow Farms in um, World's End Hambledon. And it was uh, quite a, um, in our view, in your office's view, quite a sort of an engineered bridge. Uh, and the inspector acknowledged that actually. He said it was a formal and engineered structure and he acknowledged our concerns. But he said he didn't feel that was unusual in the countryside. Um, and therefore, in terms of his assessment, he said, although it was visible uh, in distant views, the colour would light and it wouldn't be visually intrusive. Um, there would be an impact to users of the nearby footpath. However, they'd be short, uh, you know, in, in their um, in their view. Uh, and it wasn't well used anyway in the inspector's conclusions based on the appellant's advice to him. Um, so really, he concluded that the proposal wouldn't harm the character and appearance of the area. And he noted concerns reference to flooding. And I thought this was just an interesting point to pull out. But the, as the Environment Agency had raised no objection, he wouldn't consider that matter further. So he allowed that appeal. Um, so that was the second one. On the third one, it was a dwelling proposed in the countryside. Um, and the inspector fully upheld our policy position. He, he addressed that we have a spatial strategy that deals with development in the countryside. He upheld MTRA4. He said the proposal didn't meet any of that criteria. 
He noted that Shirrell Heath, where this site is, uh, is listed in our MTRA3 policy, which does allow for some infilling, although he didn't feel this site met the criteria for limited infilling. Um, he didn't feel it was a logical extension to the high street at this point. He actually felt this was a transitional uh, piece of um, the road, if you like, going from the built area to the open land, and it would represent an extension into the countryside and encroach into the open character, and he found that harmful. So that was that one, Chair. Uh, item four, now this was an unusual one, and it's not one we, we come across very often. So the description isn't very, um, doesn't embellish really what the issue was, but back in 1976, this council granted permission for 161 houses in Winchester, obviously number 17 Sycamore Drive is one of those, and it had a removal of permitted development condition on it. Uh, we had already previously refused a dormer window at this property, and that was the subject of an enforcement notice. That notice had already been upheld. So this applicant was seeking removal of that generic um, permitted development right condition on the basis that this that would make this dormer window permitted development. Now, even if that had been successful, the inspector noted that you wouldn't apply that retrospectively. Um, so in any event, but he found that the removal of the condition um, wasn't necessary, it was an acceptable condition, probably wasn't as well worded as we would do it now back in 1976, but the inspector found it was still a, a condition that could be read and understood by those in the planning profession and, and lay if, if explained and upheld that, the retention of that condition chair. So we were pleased about that. Um, and the last one in the pack uh, was again, probably more of a, you know, something that we're going to come across more and more. It was North Winchester Farm Stoke Charity. We, we've had a prior approval granted to convert the building into three units uh, by virtue of the government's uh, permitted development rights. And instead, the applicant submitted an application to demolish and replace with three new buildings. Now, the inspector broke down his assessment of that into three areas, whether it was suitable housing, whether it had an effect on the catch and appearance of the area, and interestingly, uh, whether it should make a contribution towards affordable housing. Now, again, he assessed the proposal in line with our policy MTRA4. Uh, he said that planning law requires us to have regard to the development plan unless material considerations indicate otherwise. But then he noted the uh, consent for the prior approval, which he felt should be given weight in the determination of that decision. However, he found the proposal in its own right to be unacceptable because of its visual harm, its sighting and other matters, um, and, and therefore wasn't persuaded that the replacements as proposed were acceptable. And then on the final point on affordable housing, uh, members will probably remember that in the majority, we talk about major development, 10 units or more uh, required to make a contribution to for, towards affordable housing. There is a little rider under that actually in, in the um, development management order that talks about all land of 0.5 hectares or more. And actually this site is, is 0.5 hectares and this site is that size. Um, and we'd had some strong debates about whether it should be applied to this scheme. And actually the, the inspector helpfully, some might say, some might not, but for us, we think it was helpful, conclude that actually on, on sites of that size, that affordable housing should be uh, required or a contribution to it. There was a little bit of narrative about what would be a viable uh, uh, or affordable, but the inspector didn't conclude on that because he found harm on his first point in, in terms of the effect on the character and appearance of the area. So um, I think that chairman is a sort of a summary of those five decisions, where we look a bit more robust than normal, but I've had time to read each decision in full. I'm happy to take that. Was that was useful, yeah. and I didn't know the bit about 0.5 hectares, I didn't know that. No, that's why I thought I'd pull that out today. Yeah, thank you. So Mike, you've got your um, hand up, have you? Yes, I have. Well done. <laughs> um, first of all, our thanks to Julie and her team. Um, I think this is quite encouraging. The only one that was a bit of a sorry, in a sense, was number two. Um, but at least the costs were refused. Um, would it be possible, Julie, for a copy of that particular decision, please? Um, it was a retrospective one, so it was the replacement, if memory serves me correct, of a um, Victorian bridge that crossed in that right of way. 
Yes, Chair, happy to do that. And actually, Councillor Reid just made a very good point that I I noted earlier and then forgotten to say was interestingly items one, two, and I think three were retrospective proposals out of the five. And I think that's obviously something we're picking up in applications more, isn't it, going forward, uh, the retrospective nature of them. But that didn't uh, affect the inspector's decision making in terms no. of one and three, one and four. Um, but he found number two acceptable. But we haven't had costs at all. There were no costs awarded. No, Chairman, I think what's on, on number two, as Councillor Reid said, we were able to defend off costs because although the inspector didn't agree with us, we did mount, we were able to mount, a, a, you know, defend our case as to why we considered it to be unacceptable. And that's perfectly reasonable as long as you can uh, mount your case. Now, an inspector may not agree with you, but that doesn't mean you've, you've um, you know, that the, the, the appeal shouldn't have been brought to start with and you, you've behaved unreasonably. Thank you. So, um, any more comments from any members? Only one comment, if I may, Therese. Um, congratulations. It's been quite an interesting meeting. Um, I've now got to go on for two more meetings in an hour's time. Well, I think we've learnt lots. Can we close the business meeting? So, can we turn off the um, recording? Can I, just ask, can I just ask one for clarification? The last one, which I think was, no, not the last. Um, the one, I think it's Sycamore Drive. Was that the one where the applicant had put an oversized dormer window on it? He believed he was right because he'd seen certain documentation. We believed, knew we were right. And, Number four, you mean? Yeah, mm. and he's actually been forced now to take down the dormer window. I found that that must be the case he's at, or is he applying for planning permission? Chairman Council. It was a delegated one. Councillor McLean raises a good point and that was, I, I didn't have time to get to that next level of research, I'm afraid. I had wondered if it was that same case, um, but I haven't been able to delve in that deeply, I'm afraid. Oh, I can let you know. So it is in Kingsworthy. Like it. It, is, yeah. it is in Kingsworthy. Like, yeah. We had one like it that came to committee um, yeah. in central Manchester, um, and I'm guessing it's very similar to that. I, I think, think it's the same that area. Correct, that was the Kingsworthy one we're probably thinking about. I don't think this is the same case. No, yeah, I think it might be, but there was another one in Winchester that was like it. Yeah, no, Sycamore um, Drive. I felt quite sad the poor guy, poor guy was going to be made to take it down, which I thought was a great yeah. pity, but well, we were right. Yeah, uh, but Sycamore Drive. I remind though. members that this meeting is still being broadcast. So um, I'm quite keen to call the end to the business meeting. That doesn't mean it's the end of us being together, but could we stop the recording, um, Matthew?